That is good. Ah, uh, that is good. Recorder. <laughs> ah, nanti hantarkan. We will tengok kan. Lepas boleh, ni. boleh. We will, we will store it in our. Uh, ni, yeah, campus. because risaunya sebab memang nak pergi mana mana pun sekarang kena scan and Betul. basically all your personal information are being scattered all over. Exactly, exactly. People are just made to comply. <laughs> Uh-uh. Which is which Hope. is of course okay good we know the the objective Mm-mm. is very good but Mm-mm. in terms of implementation and somebody needs yeah to... because it was, it should be only used for specific purpose that's true that's true uh. that's true uh. so but anybody can just scan through the nambi semua all this information <laughs> <laughs> and some places uh, they tend to take uh, more data than than uh, required. Oh. Uh, yeah. I use my sejahtera so everywhere is sejahtera. Uh, <laughs> kalau yang sejahtera tu standard lah. Uh, but some mm. places they have their own logbook, right? They have their own ah, uh, true. Itulah. Mm. Mm. Tapi ada yang sebab kat dia dekat Seremban so most of the apa tu uh, shop kat sini kalau dia masih sejahtera okey saja. Ah. Tak payah nak log lagi. Okay. Tapi bila kat dia pergi McDonald's untuk mm. ni dia kata tak boleh guna masa sejahtera. Oh ya. Yeah. Kena guna Facebook McDonald. Ah tu tu dia tu tu salah satu isunya. Ha. Maknanya dia orang nak ambil. Saya kata, hmm. ha, uh. Itu yang saya kata. Itu yang kata kenapa? You know? hmm. Kenapa hmm. ni dah dah government punya kenapa nak suruh pergi masuk Facebook? Dan saya tak ada Facebook. Saya kata begitu. Ah cakap itu nanti dia bagi <laughs> yang lain. <laughs> ha, dia kata oh tak apa nanti kemudian nanti bila senang senang log in dan like. What you is that? Kita that? nak you buat. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so they take this very lightly, it seems. Mm-mm. Betul. Okay. Hopefully untuk mereka yang hanya guna sebab tujuan untuk tertentu je lah. Tak guna untuk jual ke, untuk guna sebagai uh, lain. That one we never know. <laughs> that yeah, never itu know. yang kita takut. Kan? <laughs> itu yang kita takut. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so I can see... Uh, Prof Stefan and Prof Bon Bon is uh, are around. Uh, good morning. Yeah, good morning. Selamat pagi semua. Selamat pagi. <laughs> Selamat pagi. We have among the uh, the staff here Prof Juria, uh, Prof Stefan. Uh, I don't know if you whether you met her in your yeah, last visit. Yeah, we met. Yes. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So double temu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like your background. <laughs> uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I I make order. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but that the, for that not so much cows here. <laughs> yeah, you are creating. With the child, we have a space. small, we have a two-year-old daughter. This is the the only room which is in order in the moment. <laughs> yeah, I've been watching a lot of this tiny house thing, and it looks really nice like that. <laughs> <laughs> You have a loft or at the on top of the at the house. It is nice. <laughs> yeah, nowadays with that Zoom uh, stories, uh, we change totally our costumes, right? We <laughs> we show a lot of of our of our inside, right? So yeah, yeah. To take care, there. So I I, 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 I take care that it, there's not too much chaotic here. <laughs> oh, I think it's because fine. Yours is just nice. <laughs> <laughs> to my students, and then. It should be, uh, yeah, not so, not so messy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer the empty wall there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, empty wall uh, give me clear mind. <laughs> true. Our true. office true. cannot be so empty, yeah, Prof. Juria. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Because I'm at home. Sunny, <laughs> 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 so Malaysian. The background is nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Alhamdulillah, some some friends. Uh, it seems that we take little time here to to get more people. Uh, mm. uh, hopefully, they are increasing from time to time. We have Shakir, we have Omar Abbas. Hey, Omar, <laughs> how have you been? Hello, um, Omar. Prof, Prof Stefan, you have met them. My of course, uh, okay. he's uh, he was in every in every single seminar I did. Yes, of yes. course, I remember mm. him, and we had a long talk. And uh, Mr. Shakir. I was so friendly to drive me around. <laughs> Good of him. <laughs> so inshallah the yeah the the dean will be joining us also. I think we will uh, we will have 15 minutes uh, cum tempo, right? So yeah. uh, and then we start 9:15 maybe. That should be okay. Prof Bon okay with that? 
Very good, thank you. There's even a student from Dortmund there. It's Maximilian Seifert. You can oh. see him there, yeah. Oh, a very hello, good Mr. student Seifert. from our university, yeah. Cool. Ah, okay. Mm. Die steht tatsächlich auf so früh. Das ist ja klasse. Well, noting the, the time there at 3 a.m. It's very yeah. I'm, I'm impressed for you guys to actually have made it. Very. Impressed. From my oh, you know, students, you no know, our gets, students uh, are working around the clock, so no problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> your, your, your students maybe might not. <laughs> well, okay. your students are soldiers, so. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly because of that, because the enemy never sleeps. <laughs> <laughs> But they take shift from. Yeah, I receive shift. email at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, So, Stefan, you think we should wait another 10 minutes or? Yeah, maybe until 15 after 9. Because if you say 9, then people come uh, mostly a little bit later. We mm -hmm. did not announce that we start, that we gather at 8.30, but we announced it starts at 9. So, I think it's okay. Sure, sure. I will, uh, we, we can still wait. So it seems we have also some uh, one from Erlanga University, yeah. Yes, uh, from my from my uh, partner university in in Surabaya. Surabaya, okay. Juan Ibu Masito, Ibu Masito, and then. Yes, hello everybody. Hey. Hello, it's, uh, how are you? Great to see you. <laughs> hello, <laughs> Prof. Kass. You. It's been a hello. long time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a long time. Unfortunately, right? Now, uh, yeah. Normally, I would be I would be in uh, Zurabaya already in two weeks again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so many many people I believe in this region eh, are expecting you. <laughs> well, we we, uh, we would like to be in Indonesia, but we cannot. We we don't know when. Uh, we have cancellation yeah. of our flights, and I I don't dare. I'm very respectful to that disease. Yeah. And I don't want to be in quarantine in 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 abroad uh, and not true. be able to come back then. Mm -hmm, true. Actually, then, our flight would be today uh, to oh, Indonesia uh, with oh, Turkish, yeah. and we would come back in November. Uh, but as uh, Turkish uh, cancelled our flights, and as it is uh, not clear, and Indonesia still not open the border. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't know. Uh, I I applied for uh, reimbursement of the tickets, and uh, we'll maybe maybe we can go in in December. We don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because in a moment, it, it seems that also here in Europe, it, the the numbers grow again. Again, so, uh, and we the way. second wave soon. Oh, too bad. But these people, they are, are they just postponing or they are refunding the, the money, the tickets? Well, this is interesting. I will, I will talk next week about that. <laughs> yes. Uh, because, uh, <laughs> because the airlines, of course, they must refund, but they don't do. Ah. The Turkish did all, did all for uh, avoiding that the people apply for refund. So they, they switch off the option to refund, to, to apply ah. for refund. You can only take voucher or miles on this thing, no, and uh, I, uh, I, I, I called back my money by by visa, and then Turkish, uh, 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 Turkish was uh, uh, influencing visa to get the money back again, mm -hmm. and so it's very difficult. Singapore Air uh, reimbursed me the money uh, for a flight in March at once. Mm -hmm. Singapore Air was, where, but nowadays I think short. They all short before insolvency. Uh, so they all try not to pay back the money because mm -hmm. so, in the European and the European passenger uh, uh, regulation, it's clearly said that within two weeks the tickets cost must be reimbursed, and there is no mm -hmm. other there are, there's no other other option for the for the airline if the passenger wants the ticket cost, then they must reimburse. But they don't do because they say if we reimburse, then we are bankrupt. Mm. It will be interesting case to hear from you for, for next week. Yeah, we'll talk next week about this it's because it also belongs to the to the force majeure. 
And uh, part the, uh, the discussion about end of globalization, we make a discussion around, round table discussion, right? Yes, yes, good. It's more like round talk show. Um, who is user for SYZST? There is uh, Dr. Zaydul. <laughs> Ah, Dr. Zaydul, okay. Because he has two accounts that he is using, oh, and one as a backup, so that's why I think oh, yeah, uh, yeah. he has to use another pseudonym. No problem, no problem. But they can run in. Yeah, I think Prof is here. Oh yeah, the Dean. Uh, it's okay. Yeah. Let him <laughs> let him settle, and then we will. Uh, Prof, oh, yeah. welcome, Prof. Yeah. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Hello, good morning. Uh, for Stefan, it's very early morning. <laughs> <laughs> Prof, we are. We look like we just need a little more time to get uh, perhaps more crowd, inshallah. Yeah, and uh, Dalila and uh, those, uh, my students, uh, you are in the car. Welcome, welcome. No micro. So some of these students are still traveling. They are, they are, <laughs> they are in, in their cars. So they, they will uh, start anyway. Okay, so inshallah. Dr. Zaydul is uh, keeping on the waiting room, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can... Just receive. Uh, 
Do you have uh, clo uh, the university closed in a moment? Is there a lockdown in the university in the moment? No, or? actually we, we have recently uh, relaxed the lockdown. It used to be locked down. Now people can come in uh, more easily, but certainly no classes going on uh, physically. But the all, on, all, all online. Yes, yes. The administration, uh, any, uh, however, uh, is starting already started like usual. So sometimes lectures also would be going to campus for perhaps meetings, yeah, for some matters. But uh, classes uh, normally uh, will be on online. Mm -hmm. What about yours, uh, Prof. Stefan? We have in a moment uh, the holiday time. We have trimester system, uh, holiday okay. until October, and. Uh, in, uh, in the next trimester, uh, it's the choice for the professor whether they want to make it present or online, mm -hmm. uh, as long as it's not, not a big crowd. If a small course can be uh, offline, but I will go on teaching online. But this trimester, we were, ex uh, we were uh, exclusively online mm -hmm. and home office. But uh, it's also already uh, a little bit loosened. So, uh, but the teaching is online, and it was our experience wasn't was, was not so bad with that. Do you but have the a, the online uh, teaching before the pandemic, Prof. Stefan? Online teaching before the pandemic, we did not do. Uh, okay. All presence. We have a we have very small groups, so we have a small group uh, system at, in my university, and uh, mm -hmm. so we 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 had the seminaric form. My biggest groups in the in the main course in the bachelor were around 80, 80 students, but normally I have uh, groups between five to uh, to twenty, and uh, we do we did that presence. So this this pandemic really uh, bring me to 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 new uh, ways to teach and to develop uh, also maybe for the future uh, sort of uh, yeah combinations between online the hybrid uh, yeah. It's very, mm -hmm. for me very very interesting. I made I, I made YouTube uh, movies to uh, support the lectures. Uh, I made presence lectures online, and uh, we will uh, have uh, also um, um, practice uh, lectures for the future for the next trimesters. We I will do online uh, and combining it with the presence uh, lecturing, mm -hmm. and uh, the students uh, accepted that quite well. Other of my colleagues did only make movies and uh, upload it, but I think this is not a good concept. It should be at least re uh, really live, uh, so the students can react and can. Uh, but I, I use the chat, for example, very often. So the students uh, normally don't want to be seen. They don't switch on the camera, uh, and they don't want to speak often. But they write in the chat, and uh, then I can I can use this. This is a in the beginning it was very strange to to sit in front of a of a screen. And don't you don't see anyone? Uh, right. And then I, I and, and but but now we are accustomed to that, and uh, I can use the chat, and I have reactions, and so for me it's fine. Mm. And we, we did not use this. We have the problem yeah. with the data protection <laughs> with the Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I suppose in generally we have the same experience. We don't use online learning before the pandemic. So we have to become instant expert mm -hmm. on online teaching it's and learning. Exactly, <laughs> instant expert. <laughs> exactly, that's the point. And you know what? In the schools, in the in the in the normal classroom, the teachers also use these kind of apps like Zoom with the pupil. And now uh, there is uh, there is the problem that uh, the authorities, which are for the for the protection of the data, now blame the teachers because they did not use safe software. So uh, the people really are, are innovative, but are now punished for that. Yeah, uh, this is this is not a good not a good thing. This Zoom here actually is not okay. So we 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 have a special uh, account for the faculty, which is a little bit safer, but still not safe enough uh, for official things. But yeah, we we do it practically illegally. Yeah, you should not forget we are a military university, and uh, oh so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> So use, using American software, which, where we don't know where the data goes and how, how safe it is, uh, this is a little bit a problem. 
but what can we do? Yeah, we had to change to the to this system within one week. Yeah, yeah, it's the same here. We have to organize um, webinar or online workshops to train our lecturers how to use uh, online learning, how to deploy online learning and teaching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. difficult. But in the future, we will. I mean, I did not even hear about Zoom before. I, I never, <laughs> I never saw this software. Uh, I, 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 I used WhatsApp for making video telephone, but, but Zoom, I didn't know that, right? And now look yeah. where the shares of Zoom stand <laughs> in the market. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we can start, right? Or you think there comes more uh, in think, the moment? Yeah, 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 20, yeah, 23 in the last five minutes. Uh, yeah, but I, I think, think we, we should slowly start maybe. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, I think we can. Yeah, maybe we, we, must, uh, we must announce maybe the next sessions uh, already soon. Uh, that it is uh, maybe better uh, visibility. Yeah, 23 is okay, I think. Uh, okay. I think we can start. Okay. Yeah, yeah, please. Hmm. Right, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <clears throat> Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good morning to everyone. Thank you, uh, the Dean, Prof. Farid, uh, for being with us and all the uh, guests of honors. Uh, I believe everyone, uh, uh, very respected guests here, all the participants. Uh, we from Ahmad Ibrahim Kulia of Law, uh, thank you very much for uh, being with us here at this morning in this uh, precious moment, uh, introducing you this uh, uh, initiative, which is a collaborative initiative yeah, uh, between three universities, uh, Ahmad Ibrahim Kulia of Law, uh, IIUM, and then uh, Bundeswehr uh, University of Munich, and Dortmund uh, uh, Applied Science University. Uh, but before we proceed further, let us uh, recite uh, Surah Al-Fatiha. I mean, thank you. Uh, wishing that this uh, program can uh, uh, successfully uh, go and uh, uh, result in the outcome that we all benefit from it, inshallah. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome uh, all the uh, guests of honors here today. We have the Dean, Alhamdulillah, uh, he makes himself available for this uh, opening of this program, which is expected to be a series yeah, of uh, lecture uh, between the three universities, one in Malaysia, two in Germany and uh, uh, that we will have few more to come and we are going to publish to you soon the details of the, the subsequent programs. And in fact, one will be uh, following up uh, next week uh, with uh, another interesting topic. Um, I also uh, welcome um, my uh, partners, counterparts yeah, from Germany, and I must note very proudly here that they uh, make themselves available at this time in Germany, which is uh, 3 a.m. or now it should be 3.21 a.m., uh, which is really, really appreciated. Prof. Stefan Kuss from Bundeswehr uh, University of Munich and Prof. Michael Bond uh, from uh, Dortmund uh, University. Uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, before uh, Later on, before I uh, pass to uh, Prof. Stefan for, for the program, let me just uh, introduce uh, the whole thing first. And thank you for Dr. Zahidul Islam, my colleague from uh, Ahmad Ibrahim Kulia of Law, IIUM, for also uh, assisting us, uh, especially in uh, hosting uh, the webinar. Um, and of course, I must thank everyone uh, for being with us here. Uh, it will not be successful. It will not uh, start uh, without you, all of you that who, who are already here today. Uh, in the next uh, two or three hours, yeah, three hours, we will be speaking about this very interesting topic 
yeah, uh, of uh, data protection during the pandemic uh, crisis. So I note that uh, our friends, not only students and uh, colleagues from uh, ICOL and IIUM uh, across uh, faculties, we also have a few <clears throat> from other university. I note, yeah, sorry if I miss, but I note, for example, from UNISA, we have one, Dr. Nazli, who is also a cyber law expert in UNISA. Uh, welcome. Then we have a, uh, some uh, friends uh, from Indonesia, uh, uh, such as uh, Dr. Uh, Puan Masito from Erlanga University, I'm with Dr. Masito from Erlanga, so I welcome you. And I see my colleague from uh, other private universities as well, as well in Malaysia. So I, I, I believe uh, the crowd will be getting more and more, inshallah, from uh, time to time, uh, and uh, will be joining us uh, in the discussion. So uh, <clears throat> let me now just uh, pass to uh, to the next uh, agenda, which is uh, the opening remark, I uh, would like to welcome uh, our Dean, uh, Professor Dr. Farid Sufyan uh, Shoaib, uh, for uh, giving us this uh, you know, words of uh, encouragement. Yeah, because it seems, hopefully, yeah, this is like for the first of many uh, lectures, many and long uh, adventures in future. So. It will be good and it will be great actually to have you uh, in this uh, beginning and to have uh, to hear from, from you directly. So please, uh, Prof. Farid. Thank you, um, Dr. Sony. Uh, first of all, thank you, um, Prof. Prof. Stefan, Prof. Uh, Michael, and, and other colleagues. Uh, of course, and thank you also for the participants, our students, uh, and our colleagues from other universities. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, from the visit of uh, Prof. Stefan to our university last year, we continue to uh, communicate and we continue to work together to, to increase our collaboration. And with the work of uh, Dr. Sony, with, with uh, Prof. Stefan, and also uh, we have added another partner in crime, Prof. Michael Bond, um, to, to enrich our collaboration, I suppose, from uh, Dortmund Applied uh, Sciences uh, University. Um, I hope this is um, a, a new beginning, uh, although we are still in the pandemic, uh, a new beginning of our collaboration, increased collaboration that we can um, widen the depth and the breadth of our collaboration uh, in matters of our uh, mutual interests. I suppose uh, the topic is also very pertinent uh, on the data protection against uh, pandemic tracking and measurement. This is something that we are living in, that we are still living in, um, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Alhamdulillah, thanks to Allah, in Malaysia, the situation is getting better, much better. Um, the Ministry of Education projected that in October, uh, with the beginning of new semester, uh, the use all universities would be open. Uh, what exactly it means, uh, that remains to be seen. But I suppose the projection is all students then can come back to universities. Nowadays, uh, very restrictive. Only those who don't have problem can return to universities. But we are beginning opening up the universities. But I suppose the there will be revised normal, meaning although in October university will be open, I don't think we would have the same classroom situation because the physical distancing uh, would still be in place. So probably we don't have lectures. Probably we have tutorials. We still have probably we need to have online uh, lectures. Continue to have online lectures. Okay, so with that um, to control the pandemic, we have uh, the, the the tracking and measurement. Uh, we have apps to keep track of our citizens uh, to to help for for the purpose of public health. It is to help the authority to track to trace the contact, close contact and contacts of 
uh, either positive person or person under investigation. I think we can see the necessity. But at the same time, we could see also the potential risk to personal data. So of course, always in law, it is question of balance. How to balance uh, this need of public health to control the pandemic uh, with the need to maintain privacy, to maintain the rights of others. So I'm, I'm very happy that today we have uh, Professor Stefan Kuz from, uh, how to pronounce this? I'm not sure I have the correct pronoun. From Nashville University of Munich um uh, and and michael bond on dortmund applied sciences university together with dr sony to discuss uh this important uh, issue of the day and thank you also dr zahedul uh, to to moderate uh, the session and as mentioned by dr sony we are also happy to note that we have clicks uh, from other universities from from unisa from malaysia Elanga from Elanga University from Indonesia and other universities uh, to join us in this session. And uh, we also have uh, put in place several sessions. And of course, special thanks to Prof. Stefan and Prof. Michael to, to get up in the early morning. We are in our office as usual, but they have to wake up in the early morning. They're supposed to sleep now. Unless Prof. Michael and Prof. Stephen, it is their schedule to write during this uh, 3 a.m. in the morning. I don't know if that's their work schedule. So I will not take more time. Uh, thank you again for our colleagues from Germany uh, to help us put up this, this program and also this series and to sacrifice their sleeping hours. Uh, hopefully, we, we, I believe we will have a successful webinar and webinar series. Uh, so I give back to Dr. Sony. Thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you so much for your words, for the encouragement and then the wishes. And inshallah, we try to make this a, a fruitful discussion, uh, one of a uh, few to come, inshallah. And for your information and also for everyone's information, uh, so far, we have set or we have planned uh, four series of uh, online lecture or online web webinar, uh, encompassing many uh, uh, topics uh, such as today for data protection. The next will be from contract perspective, the force major during pandemic, and then next is about the competition and innovation. Uh, and also the globalization and international law uh, uh, to come, inshallah. So we will uh, keep you and everyone informed from time to time through uh, the faculty's uh, website and uh, any other uh, possible channels. So thank you for those uh, uh, who have uh, joined. Uh, uh, we see the crowd is getting bigger slowly. Uh, inshallah, uh, it is very natural to <laughs> to, to see it that way. So inshallah, well, the moment we start with the main discussion, hopefully we get uh, more people and more discussion, inshallah. So uh, from me, it will be uh, also uh, uh, all for the introduction to this program. And uh, I, after this, I shall be uh, passing uh, uh, to conduct this program to Professor Stefan Kuz. Um, and for, uh, for him to introduce about the topic and the, the speakers. Uh, and, and one of them would be me again. Uh, but before I pass it to him, uh, for the information of everyone, uh, again, uh, that's Prof, uh, Stefan Kuz and Prof. Michael Bone are here. Uh, they are all uh, based in their respective uh, German institution. Uh, Prof. Stefan Kuz, uh, as a moderator, he has been with us in the past year as a visiting professor in Ahmad Ibrahim Kulia of Law. Uh, and it's good thing that he, he told me that he left uh, IUM and he likes to come back uh, for another So here we are, not physically, unfortunately, but for now it's virtually. So Prof. Stefan, all is yours now. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Dean, for the, for the introduction, which actually already said uh, all about the topic today. 
um, we have uh, to discuss uh, with uh, my colleague uh, Dr. Zoni and my colleague uh, Dr. Bohne. Um, yeah, I'm very glad that we can continue this uh, this collaboration, and uh, we were thinking at least we can make it online if we cannot be offline there. Uh, so important is continue it, continue it and uh, consistency. Yeah. So uh, next year we hope everything will be normal or more or less normal, and then uh, and we follow the program also in persona. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, maybe I uh, introduce first uh, our first speaker. Uh, we will most of them of you will know him already, Mr. Uh, Dr. Sony Sulhuda, uh, a colleague from uh, Indonesia, working already long, right? So already several years in um, in uh, Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, I would like maybe uh, to just give some some points of his uh, career. Uh, he is expert in cyber law, in some information government, information security, and personal data protection. <clears throat> I know you already uh, also uh, often uh, present in Indonesia and Jakarta. I saw you have uh, also collaboration with Venus uh, in uh, cyber law uh, some years ago. And um, uh, he is uh, also a practitioner, uh, having more than 15 years of uh, practical uh, experience in this uh, in this issue um, in uh, also in the United States in uh, Canada uh, uh, Oxford and uh, Beijing um, yeah uh, maybe uh, we present the next speaker when he is when is his, his turn uh, maybe uh, the word is yours uh, Dr. Zoni for your presentation thank you Thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you for the kind uh, introduction. Uh, well, uh, I, let me just uh, start with my uh, with my slide. Yeah. So I will be speaking while browsing my slide. Uh, so Dr. Zaidul will will watch if anything is going uh, uh, wrong. Yeah, let me now uh, uh, share my screen. Okay, uh, and can you uh, please uh, let me know if now you can see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Yeah, we can see it. Thank you. So, okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm happy to share with you uh, on this topic. But before I move further, I also am happy to share with you that I have uh, posted about this uh, presentation in my blog. So now you can, uh, <laughs> this is like self-promotion of my blog. Eh? Uh, once in a while. <laughs> uh, okay, what happened is I have uh, posted about this uh, presentation today in my blog. It is the latest blog I posted uh, last night. So what you can get from here is uh, number one. Uh, okay, you can see the picture, which is a, an old picture, but I see my I write my summary here, uh, brothers and sisters. You can write the summary over here. But more importantly, I'd like to draw your attention to my slide. Yeah, with the slide you can download here exactly at the end of this very short uh, introduction uh, to this post. Yeah, you can download this slide in PDF. So please uh, uh, be uh, feel free to. Uh, come down here and you might want to also go to other my, my other posts. They are bilingual, uh, English and Indonesian or, or Malay. Uh, Prof. Stefan might uh, be familiar with some of those uh, Malays, uh, but try to uh, challenge yourself to, to read my article in Bahasa. Uh, uh, mostly uh, what I read in this blog is about data protection and related uh, cyber law perspectives. Okay. So you may want to see, okay, the, the, the uh, domain name or the address for this uh, page is uh, just uh, write my name, sonizulu.com, so it will take you there. All right, uh, let me now uh, start my uh, slide over here. Uh, as you see the title, Data Protection versus Pandemic Tracking and Measurements. Yeah, It has been actually well summarized by the Dean about the situation. Uh, as you know that uh, in the past uh, four or five months, uh, we have had this situation where the government and as well as the society are put on alert mode, on alert mode because of the pandemic, 
and we all are trying to help to uh, control and to uh, prevent as well as to slow down the infection uh, or the spread of the pandemic. Uh, then along the line, uh, we see uh, situations where uh, there are lots of uh, data processing uh, being uh, uh, under uh, being uh, yeah uh, undertaken yeah, by the government as well as uh, everyone yeah, virtually. So now you see wherever you go now you are ready to be uh, stopped yeah when you want to enter into any premise you are ready for that and write your name or your other details and because they will they will check your uh, body temperature. So this is what we perhaps can consider as a new norm, yeah? the new norm today. So next time you go to any outlet, if they just let you in without uh, taking any information, then you feel something is wrong, isn't it? Uh, that means we are already in the new norm. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I must uh, also inform, which I am sorry to uh, forgot to mention, that this uh, event is also uh, conducted in uh, conjunction with the uh, activities or agenda of Property Law Research Unit, OPLRU. So in ICOL, we have few units, yeah, Prof. Stefan, uh, for your information, and Prof. Michael. Uh, we have a different research unit, uh, like constitutional, and then uh, land and mar mar maritime, and this one is what we call as property law research unit. It's, it seems to be a narrow word, but actually it covers so many, uh, uh, the scope covers many areas of uh, property law, intellectual property law, as well as any part of commercial law. So uh, we have uh, the blessing of uh, the, the coordinator of this unit, which is Associate Professor Dr. Sharifa Zubaida, uh, to have our program uh, uh, attached yeah, under the agenda of the Property Law Research Unit of ICOL IIUM. Let me now show you the timeline, the, the agenda for today in my part. Yeah. First, <coughs> we will uh, see, we will do the reality check basically yeah, to see what is going on around from the perspective of uh, both pandemic as well as legal perspectives. And then we will see uh, how the data processing issues uh, 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 come to uh, uh, being, yeah, to, to become a concerns of some people, though not everyone uh, feel the concerns. Uh, then uh, we are looking at this uh, very specific legal question, how the data processing uh, uh, during this uh, pandemic yeah, crisis management uh, has triggered uh, the applicability of Personal Data Protection Act in Malaysia and also what would be the best practices yeah, during the pandemic we, we learn. As a matter of fact, the Jabatan Perlindungan Data Pribadi, JPDP, under the Ministry of the Communications and Multimedia uh, of Malaysia has come up with uh, some uh, best practice and advisory notes yeah, on this. So whether or not this is okay or this is uh, enough and whether or not it is implemented. Now, this is, of course, uh, a long way to go and only to see for us. Uh, then there will, there will be a conclusion. Uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, right. Uh, this is what I like to share with you. We, we know about this pandemic. It had started somewhere in February in Malaysia and then um, uh, right in the beginning of March, uh, the new government yeah, uh, started and then they had to deal with this uh, spread of the pandemic and starting from 15th of March, uh, the government then came up with this uh, order um, what we now have heard as, as it's very well known as MCO, yeah, Movement uh, Control Order. Yeah, it started in 15 uh, of March, which was meant to be only for two weeks, but then it had been renewed from time to time. And I was uh, commenting at one occasion that Malaysia at the time Malaysians had this uh, biweekly uh, yeah, guessing, yeah, biweekly guessing whether or not uh, the pandemic was going to be. Uh, continued yeah and as a matter of fact it had continued even until today and uh, for now it is continued until the end of august of course from time to time the phases have changed from the strict order to the more relaxed one and then now we can call it as a transitional uh, order phase but what i like to highlight to everyone's or uh, to the attendees uh, uh, attention is of course the legal basis yeah of uh, doing all this uh, 
movement control order because we we all as Malaysians here and our residents in Malaysia have experienced there are a lot yeah we have experienced a lot during the past uh, three or four months yeah the about what not to be done yeah basically it is not about do's and don'ts because there are so many don'ts compared to the do's yeah under the MCO you must not do this you must not do that you must not travel you must not uh, do uh, social activities you don't go to mosque for prayer there are a lot it is a huge and massive uh, restriction given uh, to Malaysia and I must note I must say uh, generally speaking and this is my personal note that Malaysians are very <laughs> Generally, yeah, uh, Malaysians and residents in Malaysia are very obedient. Yeah, very obedient in this respect. Uh, I must, uh, I must say that, uh, and and all this uh, control order have gone on, you know, without really uh, big uh, issues. All this one, but it is very important for us, especially legal fraternities, academia, you know, to know, yeah, or to be very uh, aware about this legal basis. As I told, you, I mentioned to you in this. Uh, slide, yeah. I I highlight to you one uh, section uh, under the uh, Prevention and Control of Infectious Disease Act 1988. So the government actually made the order with reference to this act, yeah? Act 342. Um, and because uh, this is the basis, the legal basis of the control order, and uh, I'd like to uh, take your attention to this uh, particular section, section 11, yeah, with the heading of declaration of an infected local area actually section 11.1 or clause 1 which i don't write there is the very basis of the order itself yeah because uh, clause 1 says that uh, the government can declare if any area within or throughout malaysia can be considered as a infected areas so in 15 of march the government came up with this movement control order declaring that the whole part of malaysia is an infected area yeah so that's why the control order uh, has been done uh, nationwide without uh, without fail without exception yeah so that is the basis but it's okay now i like to highlight to you what would be the consequences of that and that is what we actually have experienced all this while the consequences are referred to under this section subsection two three and four yeah in subsection 2, uh, the minister, it says that the minister may, by regulations made under this act, prescribe the measures. Yeah, It doesn't say what measures, but these measures, for what purpose? To be taken to control or prevent the spread of any infectious disease. Yeah? So it's very clear the parliament has mandated that the government can or the minister can prescribe the measures. That includes, of course, all this data processing, you know, uh, uh taking or recording uh, the data when you go to into outlets and so on so this is all part of it and you see the number three to make it more i uh, mean clearer uh, that during the continuance in force of an order made under subsection one it shall be lawful for any authorized officer to direct any person or class of or category of persons living in an infected local area which is in this case the whole malaysia or in any part thereof to subject himself or themselves to a to treatment or immunization uh, so under the during this pandemic this covid 19 pandemic of course we have seen lots of procedures medical procedures and treatments being done and they may be forced against or to, uh, against people's uh, willingness to some extent for example forcing you to check your temperature or to go through some tests, uh, screening and so on. So this is the measure. And then the next thing is uh, in clause, uh, sub clause uh, B is to isolation, observation or surveillance. Okay, now we see this very keyword. Yeah, observation or surveillance. Isolation means you must stay at home or say at your place or quarantine. And then you are being, being subject to observation or surveillance. Of course, this is not an ideal situation where you live under surveillance observation, but then it is happening now. Yeah, our friends of uh, our families who are returning from outside Malaysia now, they have to wear this uh, very specific uh, wristband, and it is pink in color. <laughs> I have seen the picture. And they must not yeah, take it off for the, for, for the duration of 14 days. And this is where the, they actually allow a government to do some observation of surveillance. Yeah? 
of course is there a data processing of course there is data processing it is about your movement it is about your web your uh, whereabouts uh, perhaps it is about what you do yeah and then the third one to any other measures as authorized officer considers necessary and this one of course it opens up yeah the all other options that are possible that and are considered uh, needed that's why we have seen the government have taken eh, so many uh, measures yeah and in fact it has been very very detailed one uh, on different sectors different activities and of course uh, the number four there it also mentions that to make sure it is being complied with yeah as a matter of fact the government in fact employs military yeah to ensure uh, when the lockdown happens when the interstate travel was, restriction was done this is all the measures and to ensure compliance they will do what they can do and uh, being uh, mandated and that is about it and this is the the situation uh, today and why we have all these uh, concerns uh, it we, from the very beginning now we can say of course it is part of the whole thing it's part of this crisis management uh, but uh, we are not really disputing on that but we will see how things are being implemented and as a matter of fact since march 2020 uh, lots of uh, countries are now going or maybe have gone under lockdown yeah under lockdown so uh, uh, that includes Malaysia to some extent. Yeah, and you see the level is different here. Uh, the darker the color is, meaning uh, the deeper or the fuller the lockdown is. Yeah, it seems that Malaysia is among the those with darker areas or darker colors because you remember that even some people who stay outside the house, just uh, just outside and in front uh, the, of the, their house yard, the the authority yeah, the police will tell them to to go home to it to go inside so it was that strict actually uh, but yes alhamdulillah we made it yeah we made it and uh, in malaysia things uh, had gone uh, so far so good i think and it comes to lockdown uh, we, we didn't have really uh, problems in terms of uh, buying uh, panic and uh, economic things yeah but yeah problems are everywhere but i think generally it has uh, gone well so <clears throat> And the reality check in Malaysia, yeah, uh, brothers and sisters, pandemic control measures means, yeah, what does it mean in Malaysian uh, experience? Um, okay, uh, I, I just uh, request uh, Prof. Uh, Stefan to also uh, remind me about the time, yeah? <laughs> uh, no, this thing happened if you keep talking, you don't see the time. Okay, the pandemic control measures means there are public screening and it is everywhere. And then patients profiling. Of course, patients have to be profiled. Where do you come from? Are you, you know, uh, having a uh, other history of uh, diseases? These things happen because it didn't happen before. You know, patients. Uh, I mean, hospitals would normally take this specific uh, view of uh, the history of the patient. But nowadays, this time, it has all to be interlinked and interconnected. And also targeted prevention. If you feel that certain places are considered as high risk, then the government will do they will take some preventive measures for that targeted uh, people so in all these measures as you realize there are or it involves uh, some uh, amounts of uh, data processing yeah it's some amounts of data processing data processing means according to the pdpa personal data protection act 2010 it means that uh, it includes almost anything that you can do with a data either you collect you compile you exaggerate you learn you study the data you analyze and then you uh, arrange the data this is all under uh, section four of the PDPA, meaning uh, uh, including recording, yeah, recording the data. So there is a, a lot, a massive uh, data processing going on. And the moment we have movement control order and lockdown measures, you know, more and more actually uh, data are put at risk, yeah, uh, such as because now on under lockdown means you go everything online, yeah, work online, study online, exam online, shop online, gaming online, and so on. So the more you are online uh, more intensely which means you are uh, readily uh, uh, giving up yeah, more data uh, on the internet yeah, in the internet or at least to the third party to the service providers and we need to understand that um, also then we have travel restrictions yeah border control so all this data will be collected and also surveilled then movement tracking technologies this is also the thing that is now keeping uh, on uh, and getting more uh, popular yeah uh, the apps uh, that had been uh, used not only malaysia of course in many other countries they do this kind of technologies and then 
the increase online traffic leads to increased risk of cyber security and personal data breaches uh, we have uh, more scam we see more phishing attacks malicious software misinformation hate speech unfortunately yeah and there was this uh, report by cyber security malaysia that in the first uh, two months of the lockdown uh, the in the, there is an increase of cyber security uh, threat uh, up to 80 percent yeah 80 percent from the time before so compared between what happened today and what happened in the past uh, in last year so cyber security malaysia it said it is uh, 80 percent rise so it is very uh, serious that this uh, online world is getting uh, more uh, uh, yeah, risky actually so among data protection risks we see that there have been illicit requests of personal data for online services apps etc this had happened yeah in our society people been complaining fake accounts begging for donation fake charities yeah, this gets more and more intensified because we have a big theme that there is pandemic there are people need to be helped you know and this uh, had put people uh, uh on uh, awareness that there is this uh, situation or donation going on so many people are falling uh, or rather being targeted yeah, by these fake accounts uh, begging for donation then uh, and then uh, the rise of citizen news portals with unaccountable stories why is that so because every time and then now people want to know what is going on yeah how many people got infected today how many people released from hospital today uh, or how many uh, fatalities happen today and people keep uh, very thirsty of knowledge so whatever knowledge uh, relating to that issue people are easily you know receiving and forwarding to others and uh, that will create this situation where you know uh, so many uh, unaccountable stories yeah, uh, and fake stories and uh, hoaxes are going around and also last but not least yeah since we have been online we have been using a lot of uh, third party uh, providers yeah who are not necessarily secured yeah because as a matter of fact there are a lot of new new uh, platforms online that we never used before and it never been under the uh, under the you know uh, uh, control of the of the organization or the office for example my office IAUM allows you know lecturers to use uh, any online you know um, learning method so Sometimes we are at we are at dark whether actually these uh, platforms are secured or whether or not they have uh, problems in terms of uh, data protection and so on. This increase the the the, the issue of uh, data protection uh, problems. Uh, I give just example where UM researchers uh, design a digital thermometers that can collect real time data, which is this is good. I'm not saying bad about this, but because there is a risk of data processing there because it is a real time data and you better make sure whatever data to be collected and what not to be collected yeah because according to the pdpa you are not going to collect just any data you know only the data which is uh, which is relevant for your work and for the purpose of your work then uh, some illustrations here from the real experience in malaysia uh, the first one says uh, uh, saying uh, this is a poster in bahasa if you see anyone going uh, against the interstate uh, banning or restriction, interstate travel restriction, so you better inform the authority. This is actually happening, and I, I feel in my heart, oh, this is not so good, because it creates, you know, people like surveilling each other. When they see uh, their neighbors going for, you know, balik kampung, and then some people will do, will make a report, will detect picture. Or if people see uh, on the road, some people with two or three people inside the car and then other people will take the picture and send to authority or send to media well uh, well intentioned but i think i don't think it is a good practice to just uh, do surveillance to uh, any people yeah and then at the right side here there uh, this uh, had happened in a very short period of time when the police required people who wanted to travel interstate to uh, fill up the form and put so many records there but, uh, and, uh, but fortunately this practice was not uh, continued instead they went for the online one uh, but still on the issue of how much data you are actually collecting uh, that one is still not being uh, controlled yeah then uh, people using the body temperature this is i think just a joke because people uh, been seeing uh, people using this uh, 
yeah, uh, body temperature, equipment, and you don't have to raise your hand for that. You are not being targeted for shooting. Yeah. Then uh, you see in the middle there, the, the person wearing a pink uh, wristband. This is the surveillance wristband, especially for those who are supposed to be quarantined. In the past, of course, we don't have this because people are sent to quarantine, to quarantine. But now, uh, now people are told to use the wristband and you are not going to de destroy or defect, uh, uh, destroy this in, for the 14 days. So it can, you can be tracked whether you are traveling or not. Yeah. So these all give illustrations about the data protection risk happening nowadays in our society um, and which can be an issue yeah, uh, from time to time. Uh, you see here the illustration. Sila tulis dan tembak kepala sendiri. Okay, thank you. Uh, Prof. Stefan, for your benefit, and Prof. Michael, it means uh, please write your data and, and shoot your own head. <laughs> Tembak kepala sendiri, yeah. Very interesting. This has gone viral, but this actually shows you the practice going on that people you uh, write in the log books, yeah. So people now going to outlet, they have to write these uh, things. They have to. Write. Some of them they will use the uh, My Sejahtera apps, which is provided by the government. That one is, I would say, um, yeah, perhaps better because it goes to the government and government is the one who will keep the data but we also of course see everywhere also where the outlet uh, business outlet keep the data for themselves in their own log books and some of them in fact uh, require the participants to go into the Facebook account of that outlet I was just informed recently uh, just now by Dr. Juria what happened to her so they were using uh, this a uh, fast food restaurant uh, chain they they require uh, the participant or the visitors to go to their Facebook and put the data in that Facebook. So that is that is uh, what had happened. Uh, so uh, this is situation where so many data protection risks going on. Government had launched pilot projects to monitor the spread of COVID-19 pandemic via app. So basically there are a few apps now. I think maybe some, some of the participants here have uh, used some of them. We have My Sejahtera, we have My Trace and we have Gerak uh, Malaysia, yeah. So this was uh, promoted by the ministers. You see, ministers here are holding the posters. So one of them is My Sejahtera. It says, "Help us to help you." It will help uh, government to assess uh, the health risk, to get uh, to give guideline, and then uh, also guidance on the risk category, and also giving information, and as well as you know, uh, spreading. Even without this one, yeah, brothers and sisters. I believe you have been receiving so many SMSs, yeah? SMS from time to time to time to time. By MKN especially, they are telling you next uh, guidance and so on and so forth, yeah? And we never, we never sign up for this uh, service, of course, but then this is like a, uh, a mandatory yeah, from the MKN through the cellular and the service provider to give all this information and very important information. People so I'd like to highlight to your attention as well. We have, uh, I have uh, visited, uh, at least uh, start to see these three different uh, apps yeah, in Malaysia currently people are using. My Sejahtera, then Aplikasi uh, Gerak Malaysia, especially if you want to go interstate travel. And then My Trace. My Trace is uh, very specifically to trace uh, the movement and to ensure uh, whether or not to know whether or not you have been in an area which has been infected or which has been also visited by other uh, COVID-19 patients. So I have heard that my trace has now been uh, embedded under the My Sejahtera, but I know, but for now there are three different applications. Yeah. Now uh, from the privacy perspective or from the data protection perspective, of course, first thing first, you must know that the data protection processed by the government in Malaysia is exempted from PDPA, is exempted from the law. So this is a unique uh, law in Malaysia that it uh, exempts the PDPA, exempts uh, governments, yeah, the data processed by government, the government processing. So all these three are actually by governments, yeah, by mostly by you know, uh, consortium of the governments, including the MCMC yeah, and uh, MKN and so on. So, so there is no question that the data processed by them are actually exempted yeah, from the PDPA. 
However, what we can also say is that even though it is exempted, eh, there are a few risks here. Number one, number one, in uh, using these uh, apps, yeah, uh, <coughs> you, uh, we, we want to see uh, actually how much uh, data actually had been uh, acquired. And this one, this slide actually tells you, which I downloaded from their own uh, pages uh, in, in Google, uh, down uh, Google Play Store, is it? Yeah, Google Play Store. Uh, I, I check in each and every uh, apps, what is uh, the scope of the app's permission? App's permission means when you install this app, you actually grant a permission yeah, to this app provider to access yeah, to all this. Yeah? So we see each and each of these apps actually, when you install them, you actually give them access yeah, to each of these. And then now you can see the camera, yeah, for example. So to the extent that it can uh, allow you uh, access to the pictures and videos. Yeah? And then location, yeah, of course, this is, I think, the main thing. Uh, access the precise location, access the approximate location, as well as the movement, because from one location to the other location means you are moving. Yeah, uh, and then telephone uh, records. You see, I'm reading now the my sejahtera part, and then the storage. Yeah, meaning if the apps, uh, you give the apps permission to modify or delete the contents of your SD card. Is it not something <laughs> that raised the eyebrows? Yeah. And it also allow the apps to read the content of your SD card. So I don't know if this has been really seriously given a uh, thought about, but this is a this is when you say this is the app's permission, meaning technically, technically, yeah, it is possible for these apps to actually do just that. Or whether or not they do that, it's actually another matter. Yeah, it is actually another matter. Yeah, but it is allowing uh, such a uh, the apps, yeah, to, 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 to do this on your mobile and also others, yeah. Oh, uh, and you, if you have used a uh, Grab Malaysia for interstate travel, you must know that you actually have give uh, the apps permission, yeah, uh, that, uh, yeah, that you see, uh, my request access to this. You see, it, it says that it may request access, but you never know actually when is the access being requested. Yeah, but it gives uh, the idea that this uh, is the technical capabilities of the apps that can go down into the very private and confidential data that you have in your gadgets. Um, but then people say, okay, this is all for uh, pandemic uh, control and it is done by uh, the Malaysian government which perhaps uh, will give you some uh, feel of assurance, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that there is no uh, misuse. Yeah? Uh, after all, uh, PDPA doesn't apply to the government, but uh, it is, I think, very uh, natural to, to have this concern uh, to, uh, to, at least we need uh, good communications and the government needs to have uh, this clarified whether or not and to what extent they actually uh, use uh, the data uh, that is uh, captured by each of these uh, apps. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but there is also another another re another issue. I must tell you that when I say that the PDPA as a statute does not apply to government, but you must remember that in Malaysia the issue of data privacy is not only uh, it's not only governed by the PDPA. We actually have a bigger common law principles and the Malaysian courts have decided in some cases, in high court cases, uh, that people can uh, be given their right uh, to keep the privacy of their data. This is common law principles. So it doesn't have any exemption, meaning, it, I mean, the exemptions that the government enjoy from uh, under the statute of the PDPA um, does not necessarily apply to the common law rights, meaning uh, when it comes to the right of data privacy, people may be coming up and asking questions, you know, and they may want to know because now people are more aware about their data and the privacy need to get a privacy. So people may want to know what you do with the data. So I believe the government side should be ready to answer and to anticipate yeah, these concerns in case uh, people wanted to know what uh, the data have been used for, where are they kept, 
who are people who have access to the data and whether or not the data is actually being destroyed, uh, you know, if they are no longer used. You know, these kind of questions uh, so, uh, sooner or later will actually uh, arise and, and I hope the governments are uh, keeping attention to these issues. Okay, my next slides uh, give you uh, some idea about the PDPA itself, but I think uh, for many of you here, it is not new. Uh, and please read, uh, maybe you can go back uh, more on about the PDPA, but I might, what I can say, the act is a uh, regulate processing of personal data in commercial transactions. That is another issue, whether or not things uh, fall under commercial transaction. Of course, when you go to business outlets, or schools or cinema or anything else, you know, it is all business, uh, business, yeah, business uh, uh, definition and, and wider scope. But some, some programs are considered non-business, non-commercial, like charity. Uh, this is where the gray area may happen and therefore PDPA may or may not apply in that case. And I mentioned to you already that the governments are exempted um, uh, from the operation of the PDPA. So this is uh, here the big concept of the personal data protection in Malaysia. Uh, might not be, uh, you know, uh, going uh, very deep to this, but if you are my students in cyber law class or uh, Dr. Mahyudin students in IT law class, you have had this in your class yeah, to learn under data protection law or for any other people you may have been uh, reading or may have heard about this. Uh, this is all about it. Uh, so what is personal data? Just to give you an example, any data that you give about you that may be related to you directly or indirectly, it is your personal data. So in any case, they are asking your data, you have right over it. You know, I, I see that some business outlets will be asking you more data than what they are supposed to. For example, name, uh, phone number and then they also have a space for IC number. Why would they want IC number? And the government had made it clear that you don't need to give the IC number, but you see some outlets may do that. Because why? Because our data is very valuable and it is just the right time, you know, a good opportunity if they can get more, the more the better in their, in their case, meaning they can do better profiling about us, you know. So in this case, of course, it is your data because by that data, we are talking about IC number, for example, with that data, it can relate about you. It can be, you can be identified, yeah? You can be identified or be identifiable with that. And therefore you can have a no to that. You can actually, the PDPA gives you right not to give the consent over this unnecessary, uh, unnecessary uh, procedure, yeah? Uh, that's why, um, unfortunately, many of us in our society, they don't know about this right and they happily uh, surrender their personal data, whatever it is, as required by the business outlet. So they uh, even uh, write uh, their addresses. It happened uh, to me, I saw that some places actually require the address and I said, why you need this? And you, you need to ask why, because this is the new norm when it comes to data protection, ask why. Ask why you need my data. Yeah, this is, we don't do this before, but you need to do this now and data protection act, which gives you right to just do that. Okay, uh, this is the gist of about personal data protection, which is uh, seven principles, right to give consent or rather about the rule about consent and then to give notice and choice to the people so they need to inform us, yeah? They need to inform us uh, uh, whether they collect data and, and whatnot. Because as a matter of fact, during the pandemic, yeah, there are many ways of them collecting our data. Of course, the main, the most obvious one is by writing in the logbook or by, you know, putting your, uh, reading the QR code. This is data collecting, but you, you realize that also there is CCTV collecting your movement, yeah? Collecting the data of your movement then uh, there could be many other ways. Uh, so uh, the best practice according to the PDPA is that you must inform, you must notify people of your data collection activity. That's why everywhere we see that this place is under CCTV and whatnot uh, because it is necessary uh, for the purpose of uh, uh, data collection, uh, notice and choice principle. And then disclosure principle, make sure the disclosure is uh, is authorized, you don't disclose to third party which are not uh, authorized. And then this is very important, the security principle. You see, 
many of these outlets, yeah, they put the logbook just like that, open, naked, neck to naked eyes also can be seen, yeah. So anybody who just pass and they don't enter, they just pass and they just pick the. If they see, oh, in one in one of the uh, visitor, there is this uh, famous person, uh, and there is a mobile number of it. Then anybody can just take his phone and then take a picture of this logbook, which is open. How is that? This is wrong because you allow the unauthorized disclosure, and it is not secure. Yeah. You can imagine that if anybody, you know, uh, Dean, for example, <laughs> our Dean, yeah, write his name in one of the business outlet and then uh, the phone number. Not only people would know that he was, as a matter of fact, visiting that outlet, which is which could be private as well, or which he might want to keep it private as much as possible. And secondly, also there is a phone number for just everyone to grab it. So. So this is already an unauthorized disclosure and they should keep it away from people's view yeah so uh, a lot of this need to be looked into uh, yeah. then also issue of retention uh, how long you are going to keep it and then whether or not the data is correct you know, this is interesting because i don't know whether you actually when you write your name on the logbook whether you actually write it correctly because we do encourage it, it should be a correct and, 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 and accurate. Yeah? Otherwise, it, it may not be helpful at all. Yeah? Uh, but when it is accurate, of course, make sure you also secure it. Yeah? Put it on security. And then also on access means people should be able to access the data that has been collected earlier. Yeah? So this is the seven principles for the benefit of people who have not uh, got this before. Okay, let me just skip. Okay, there is a very... Uh, quickly uh, speak 10 minutes more is that okay yes it is okay exactly thank you so much so the pdpa creates new data offenses yeah okay people say then what what so what so what about all this yeah uh, is there any liability yes under the pdpa there are so much uh, that you better be aware of because it uh, imposes criminal liabilities yeah uh, if anything is not in line with the principles of data protection under the PDPA, then the fine can go up to 500,000 ringgit. Yeah, 500,000 ringgit, more than 120,000 US dollar. I think. Yeah, more or less like that. Yeah, 120,000 dollar US dollar. So for many reasons, for example, breaching data protection principles or failure to register as data user because you need to register and then unlawful collection of personal data like i just told you in this uh, people make use and take opportunity of this pandemic to gather as much data as possible which is unlawful then it can be uh, infringing the pdpa then unlawful sale of personal data yeah as well as a breach of data security system and this is all we can refer to the PDPA 2010, or there is actually a regulation, yeah, data protection regulations, uh, 2013, that we can also refer to that there are some offenses yeah, being used. Okay, uh, let me now proceed. Okay, so how would the situation today trigger uh, PDPA 2010? As we have said, general exemption of processing of personal data by government. Is it a blanket exemption? Yes, it is a blanket exemption. So as long as it is processed by government, then it can be, and then it is exempted. What about a third party working for the government, meaning for the purpose of uh, government purpose, then uh, also it is considered as government's uh, data processing. Therefore, uh, therefore, it will not be uh, subject to the PDP. i give you an example. We have some uh, private sectors uh, uh, appointed by governments uh, or business uh, businesses appointed by governments to do some works. For example, uh, for uh, uh, road tax, and you know we have this my just example. Yeah, uh, they are not part of the government as a company, but they are you know they are required and they are asked uh, by, the, by the government to do this government uh, work renewing license and all that so as far as the data belong to the government they are not actually uh, accountable for that but of course for any part that they did in their own uh, work they would still be accountable so we must re differentiate between whether or not it is they actually do it 
on behalf of the government or they actually do it for their own purpose yeah if it is done by for their own purpose for their own work so they are just equally uh, responsible or accountable what about a private entity that exploits data in the pretext of complying the government's order this is also not uh, right I gave you example of the business outlet saying that the government require them to collect data of visitors but instead what they do is actually they collect data for themselves yeah because they realize that this is just a nice time to get just as much data possible what do they do with data people might be wondering so what you know this data can be a very valuable uh, commodity yeah they can be actually they can proceed to profile the data and then exaggerate the data and then all uh, you know uh, mix it up and create a very nice profile uh, and can be always uh, sold or maybe offered to other people who want to use the uh, profile for their own purpose such as marketing and so on so we don't want this to happen because when we record the data during this pandemic our intention is actually to help the government um, controlling the situation and no other intention and no other objective and therefore should uh, these businesses the business outlets uh, use the data for any other objective or any other purpose then it is wrong in law and they can uh, be the infringing law can be you know taken into account under this act yeah <clears throat> uh, okay we have situation that <clears throat> uh, this pandemic uh, we actually deal with lots of uh, health information and as far as the pdp is concerned health information is considered as sensitive personal data which requires a, 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 a what do you call this explicit consent yeah it requires an explicit consent yeah uh, however this explicit consent may be waived if it is necessary for example we have patients being admitted to the hospitals and there is no way to actually get his consent to to collect his swab uh, sample so it is considered necessary because nowadays we have to do fast and to ensure whether there is a infection of covid-19 and so on and so forth yeah so this is the situation meaning as long as it is used for the purpose of pandemic control it is uh, the pdpa gives allowance actually yeah uh, allows that for that purpose yeah it is considered necessary as well and also for anything which is medical purpose then then also there is some partial uh, exam exemption given by the pdpa so so it is not that pdpa will uh, ban or will prohibit everything no but it actually gives some solutions and some exemptions yeah for uh, partial exemptions such as medical purpose yeah so we have some apps which is used for the health assessment for contract tracing so if it can be linked to medical purpose then the then the chance is that you can get some partial exemption under the PDPA. Okay it's uh, some details about partial exemption under section 45 for example if it is done for the purpose of physical or mental health of data of data subject and then for the purpose of you look at the third part there the third row uh, for the statistics uh, you see every day now we will uh, stay on tv or on our on the internet at 5 or 5 30 pm waiting our hero dr nur hisham eh, the dg of the ministry of health telling us how many people are infected today how many people are discharged from hospital yeah and so on and so forth and you realize every time he announced this it they are they are given they never give identifiable data right of course they have the identities but when it comes to giving to the public they all need to be unidentified unidentified or anonymous or anonymized yeah this is part of what the pdpa wants or uh, yeah uh, compares that the no 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 data no no identifiable data should be given uh, as a as a result of the research or statistics okay let me just show you the this is survey uh, i will be finishing soon i believe this will be um, towards the end uh, this has been the guidance from the jabatan perlindungan data pribadi or the Mini, uh, department of data protection personal data protection department under the ministry of health uh, uh, sorry ministry of communications and multimedia and i'm 
honored yeah, uh, to share with you also that I have been uh, involved by them in the past, I think, five years or so uh, to help them in one way or another in giving talks, in uh, drafting some uh, uh, draft regulations or in reviewing some, uh, you know, some rules. Well, uh, I'm feeling honored uh, that they uh, involved me and uh, involved uh, ICOL, uh, IAUM, yeah, for this uh, works. So among others, this is their latest work, which I'm not uh, involved at the, for this one, uh, saying that what you should do, what you should not do when you are collecting the records of the visitors during this pandemic. Yeah? Uh, so details are there. You can check on their uh, website. And I think I'm coming towards the uh, concluding slides. Uh, okay. Yes, yeah, sorry. There are some concerns that I highlighted here, which I already highlighted before. Any third party service provider is a data processor that's subject to security, disclosure, as well as detention principles. You see, uh, third party service providers sometimes, yeah, where they are involved in the data processing, but they are they are uh, hiding yeah, behind the shield of the service provider. They said, oh, we are only giving service to these people. It is not us, the, the data is not with us. We are just providing the platform and so on and so forth. But under the PDPA, there are some uh, rules that can be extended to them that even though you are only service provider, you can also be liable for some reasons, yeah, including the security issues. Then it is very important to have privacy policies, yeah, uh, informed to our to people, to public. Yeah, uh, in any time you are collecting data, then uh, privacy policy is actually a method for you to notify public what you do with the data. And I mentioned to you about these common law rights for individuals. Yeah, uh, I have some of my students doing the their work, actually work on this. Uh, uh, and there is a room for improving the law. It's gone through some reviews and uh, the ministry are looking at uh, proposing the amendment in uh, near future. Uh, for example, on the issue of data breach notification, uh, meaning if you, if you suffer some data breach, then you must inform, you must notify the authority. And then the requirement to have data protection officer and then regulating data processor as well as uh, transborder data transfer. For example, you deal with uh, people, uh, public, uh, sorry, with partners outside Malaysia, so there are few rules need to be related. Okay, this is uh, the conclusion part. Pandemic, yeah, it's not a basis for relaxing the rule. Uh, this one, I think, must be very clear to all of us, yeah. The pandemic leads to system and, and governance uh, possibilities, yeah. Uh, sorry, vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities. And alert, and we must be on alert mode on data protection. The massive, massive exemption given to the government is not a license to download, download regret their data protection. Just be government. Remember that we are to, to, to respect and to uh, still preserve the data privacy. Then private entities do not enjoy the same, same exemption. While complying with the data rules is one of those, relaxing on data protection is not an option. And as Malaysia is battling COVID-19, we shall strengthen trust and maintain sustainability. Therefore, relaxing data protection will only create element of distrust. We don't want people, we suspect each other and we, we report each other because of this data issue. That's why it's very important in time, the crisis time, that we strengthen the the element of trust among the society between one to another in the society or between the citizens and the governments yeah to ensure that <coughs> among others yeah, we still uh, keep uh, data protected yeah, properly uh, that will be uh, the end of my presentation thank you for the attention given and we shall move forward if you have any discussion and uh, now back to you uh, Stefan thank you thank you much. Dr Sony for the very interesting presentation which uh, from our perspective in Europe shows us that there is a lot of parallel questions <coughs> of course like collecting the telephone numbers when you register somewhere we have that with restaurants and uh, also very interesting for me and uh, uh, very much to emphasize is 
the equilibrium between uh, the fundamental rights and the protection of the individual um, uh, and the protection against the pandemic. So the pandemic cannot uh, give us the freedom to, uh, to, to set off every rights of individual and, and uh, also to uh, loosen the fundamental rights of the citizens, right? So we must find a good equilibrium. So we will hear uh, from the German perspective now uh, the presentation uh, by my uh, dear colleague, Professor Bohne, uh, which is actually my oldest friend wow. in, uh, uh, in my life. We know each other already since 1995. Wow. Since 1995. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, making, making, he was making his doctorate in the same uh, professorate in the same chair like me in Konstanz, uh, Professor Dr. Dr. Carsten Thomas Ebenroth, and we had a great time together. Um, we uh, also, uh, we don't have that, such a blog like you, uh, which is uh, really interesting, we should also think about that, but what we have uh, is uh, we started with the YouTube channel, uh, Law Talks, uh, um, which uh, uh, is partly also in Indonesian uh, language, subtitled. Um, you see this here. And uh, so some of the topics we also discuss in this, uh, in this blog. So um, Mr. Bohne uh, is an expert in data protection, teaching in uh, the University of Applied Science in Dortmund in West Germany. Mm -hmm. He is uh, also a practitioner. He is off-counsel in, uh, in a uh, Düsseldorf law firm. And uh, uh, he uh, was uh, also uh, employed in one of the most famous uh, cyber law uh, chairs uh, in uh, Münster many years. Um, and uh, so I give the word now to, uh, to Professor Bohne for giving us a presentation about the data protection situation in pandemic in Germany and Europe. The word, the, 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 the word is yours, Mr. Bohne. Yes, thank you very much, Stefan. Very nice to be here. Thank you all um, our new friends in um, Malaysia and all over the world. Thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here and to talk with you about data protection law because it's one of the most important and most interested areas in law um, the last years. And especially, as you know, that we have... Um, a new data protection law in the European Union, the general data protection regulation. And therefore, uh, now we have to um, um, use it in every member state of the European Union. And so we have a um, similar law in uh, Europe. Nevertheless, you have still some differences between uh, the countries, and we will talk about it. So, first of all, I should. Um, show you my presentation how can i do it stefan with um you can see my presentation now powerpoint is just starting yeah oh, now very good very good okay you can see it Yes, Stefan? we see that. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. And uh, just to start, you know, uh, it looks um, to the rest of the world um, as if Germany was coping particularly well with the pandemic. Um, on the one hand, this is due to the measures of the government, of course, but on the other, on the, on the other side, it's also connected to the pictures um, we had from Italy. Uh, where they have a lot of um, deaths and so the people were really shocked in Germany and so um, it was not so difficult in the beginning to educate the people to behave in specific uh, um, ways for example social distancing and all the other stuff to be in the lockdown so it was in the beginning more or less voluntarily and the people um, were really concerned about the virus nevertheless now i have the um, impression that possible there will be a second shutdown it's uh, quite possible probably in autumn 
and the people are now becoming more careless because we have um, less dead people than in other European countries. Uh, so um, at the moment, the, the atmosphere is like, okay, now we can start with everything again, although we have special measures uh, still in force. But, um, well, you, got, you get the impression at the moment that um, the people don't take it as serious as in the beginning. So we will see how it uh, will de uh, develop the next month. Um, most of the points um, our colleague Sonny said, and he talked about data protection law, it is very similar to the regulation uh, we have in Europe now. So the fundamental principles are really um, very European, I will say, or we are very Malaysian probably <laughs> in Europe. Um, and there are, but there are also some um, differences, and probably we can talk about this because all you described, um, Sonny, is um, very much the same we have over here. Nevertheless, um, the new general data protection regulation contains some special points, and probably it's interesting for you uh, to hear about what are the differences because. Um, as I learned from your presentation, very good. Thank you again for it. It was really interesting and I learned much um, about your law. You uh, talked about that there should be a data breach notification duty. Um, it is included into the general data protection regulation. You also uh, said we need data protection officers. That's also included in the uh, GDPR, general data protection regulation that we need a regulation of the data processes and that we need some um, regulations on trans-border data transfer. That's what you um, told us. And they try to um, introduce it in the new regulation. So probably they have heard about your wishes and then they implemented it in the law. Uh, but um, now it is contained in the new law. And there is a special notice and a special decision given by the European Court of Justice just yesterday. So we have really a breaking news uh, to you. Probably this could be interesting for you because it's about transborder data transfer. You see, it's very important because it is about the transfer of personal data uh, to the US, to the United States, uh, because under the new regulation, you need a justification uh, why you should be um, able to transfer data abroad to third countries. There are some countries in the world that are um, defined as secure countries in the sense of data protection. It is, for example, Argentina. I don't know why, but Argentina, New Zealand, um, Israel, Norway, Switzerland, and, and so on. And I think it will be also Great Britain when um, they um, left the EU totally, uh, we will see. These are the so-called secure countries. So there it's not uh, necessary to have some special safeguards to transfer data to these countries. For example, it's no problem to transfer data to Switzerland. It's no problem at all. It's the same then um, you transfer data from Germany to Italy. So um, this decision of the European Court of Justice is binding for every country in the European Union. So for Germany, France, Spain, Italy, and so on, Poland, all the 26 member states. And it's overruling national law. You see, this is um, like German law. For us, the general data protection regulation is law. It's German law. And it's um, um, overrule all other regulations we have in Germany. You have also, additionally, um, a German data protection legislation. But in this legislation, they um, only um, rule some uh, points of uh, employment, data protection law, and so on. And it's all overruled by the general data protection regulation. 
And uh, what does the court decide? The court decides that um, there is a there is an agreement between the EU and the US, the so-called EU-US privacy shield. This privacy shield means that enterprises, companies in the US can be certified under this special privacy shield and then you are allowed to transfer personal data to uh, such entities. For example, Microsoft or um, other big companies. So they must have a, um, yeah, they must be certified by some organizations and then you are able to transfer personal data to such um, entities. And this um, decision is about Facebook. And it's the second decision whether it is allowed to transfer personal data to the US under specific um, agreements. The first agreement was the uh, safe harbor agreement, and it was already rejected by um, the European Court of Justice. And now the court um, also rejected um, the EU US Privacy Shield Agreement because they said that this agreement um, has not enough focus on the personal rights of people, that they don't have um, possibilities to enforce their personal rights under the regulations. Because you have still uh, organizations in the US, um, state organizations, uh, who are allowed to um, control personal data, even from people um, living in the EU, or data um, hosting in the EU. So they said it's not um, possible to transfer personal data under this agreement. And this is of course a big problem now at the moment because um, theoretically it would be forbidden in this very moment to transfer personal data via Zoom uh, to the US, via servers um, hosted in the US. So. Under a European law, it's forbidden at the moment. And the court says, and this is um, like a backdoor, um, it is still possible to have um, contracts between the processor and the, um, the processor in Europe and the processor in the US under standard contractual clauses. You have regulations, um, of the Commission, of the European Commission, um, with special standard clauses. And the Commission uh, says, okay, when you use this standard contractual clauses with your counterpart in the US, then you are allowed to transfer data. It's the same with Malaysia. When you want to transfer personal data to Malaysia, you must um, conclude an agreement based on this um, standard contractual clauses. And now it will be the same with the US, that you have this specific agreement. And it means as a result that now the responsibility is back to the entities. It means that as a German entity, now you have to uh, take care that your data are uh, treated in an in a, um, acceptable way in, in, in the US. And this is really difficult how to handle it. We just got uh, the decision yesterday, so it's really um, a really difficult situation, especially you have Zoom, you have WebEx, you have all these um, providers and hosters all over in the US. So that's for international data transfer. Very important in these times when it comes to the use of um, online services. And it is in the end, as the Dean already said, always that you have to um, keep a balance between the protection against uh, the epidemic and on the other hand, um, also to have safeguards for, for personal rights. And so on the one hand, data protection law, of course, can be in a way um, a problem for the protection against epidemics. You see, even in the fight against COVID, because um, just take the example of um, 
Zoom. In Germany, a data protection officer, the data protection officer of Turinga, decides that, um, or of Berlin, um, said that Zoom couldn't be used by public schools. It is forbidden. Mm -hmm. So you see, uh, and this uh, have really, um, it, it, we have this data protection officers as you want it in, in Malaysia, Sony. Mm -hmm. But this could be on the other hand also a problem. It could also stop new developments, for example. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so it's always difficult uh, to strike a balance, of course. Yeah, true, true. And um, just to come back to your data protection officer system, of course, in Germany, because we like it to have it more complicated than in other countries, <laughs> we have even more than one data protection officer. We have 16 data protection officer in all 16 federal countries, plus yeah. a federal data protection officer. So we have 17. Mm -hmm. And they're all able to strike really far going decisions. So they are really, they really um, have a lot of power to enforce the law. So um, we come to the fines. This is one of the biggest um, differences because uh, probably to Malaysian law. Um, this is about fines. You see, you have, a, you have two stages and the fine could be up to 20 million euro or 4% of the total worldwide annual turnover of the enterprise, of the group. 4%. It's like in a competition law. They ha you have also, Stefan knows, because he wrote about it in his dissertation, you have all, also a really high level of fines in antitrust law, for example. But now you have it very similar in data protection law. You see up to 22 million US dollars, 22 million or 4%. And in Germany, we already have cases where data protection officers decided that a company has to pay 14.5 million euro, let's say 16 million euro fine, because um, for the breach of data protection law. Now we have a new decision, it's 19.5 million euro. So it's yeah. over 20 million US dollar. Um, and um, that's a company which uses personal data for, for um, telephone calls, for, uh, mm. uh, for um, marketing reasons. They, they use this, uh, let's say 500, um, phone numbers yeah. without consent. Um, without consent. And so uh, in the end, it means that um, they really have power in Germany and in Europe. And especially in Germany, because we have 17 of them. <laughs> so you see, and uh, with the high, really high fines, of course, you can go to court, to administrative court, and to fight against the fines, but um, we will see how they decide it. And at the beginning, you have to pay. You have to pay the 19.5 million euro. Uh, of to, one, yes? These 17 uh, data protection commissioners, are they independent from each other? They are totally they, uh, they independent. Work? They are totally independent because it's organized on... Um, on federal level, of course, but also in the different federal countries. Okay. Nice. And they are also um, independent from government. Wow. All right. Wow. Okay. Well, they are, they are, they are um, installed by the government, of course, the data protection officer by the parliament. Uh, but um, he is free in his decision or her decision. And that uh, leads in some cases to really strange decisions. I can tell you, for example, in Berlin, they are discussing the case um, whether it is necessary to inform people about their personal rights uh, when you give them your um, business card, whether we need special um, rules on it. 
Yes, I mean, we have a pandemic, you know, we have COVID-19 and they discuss about the subject, whether you need um, a consent to store the data and you need um, information on it uh, and you have to hand it to the other person. Uh, let's think about it, Sony, when we meet and you hand me uh, over your business card, you have also to give me all your um, privacy notes, your privacy um, regulations. So um, to have data protection offices, on the one hand, it's really a good system. On the other hand, it can really um, um, come to very strange decisions. And of course, you can challenge it into court after. And that's good to do so. But uh, nevertheless, now the GDPR is working for two years and we don't have so many cases. On it. So the case law is really that you have only few decisions in Germany and few decisions in other European countries. So we will see how it, it uh, will work in the future. So one of the big differences to your system, as I see, is that um, we have far uh, higher um, fines. And especially uh, to have this 4% of total worldwide annual turnover could be really um, lead to a fine, let's say, 2 billion euros, something like that, in theory, or 3 billion euros. When you have Facebook, 4% of the total worldwide annual turnover, this could lead to really high uh, fines. So, um, when we look at the uh, definition of uh, the fundamental um, institutions of the data protection law, let's say, for example, what is processing? Now it is Article two number, uh, Article 4, number 2 of the GDPR. You see, it's very similar to your regulation in Malaysia. It is all um, any operation performed or not by automated means. And um, nearly everything is covered. Collection, recording, organization, structuring, storage, adaption, alteration, retrieval, consulting, and, and so on. So nearly everything um, connected with personal data means it is an act of processing. So that's very similar as I understand you, Sony, to your definition. So, and this is uh, significantly broader than it was before under uh, the German, the solely German uh, federal data protection act. So, um, in the field of the coronavirus, of the pandemic, um, we have also four offices, and uh, most of them you already addressed in your presentation, and so you see we are very similar. Province is on the one hand the legitimacy of the corona warning app. There was a big uh, discussion in Germany whether we should have an app where you have an exchange and with a, with a central storage of the data and where you have exchange between different mobile devices and then you store it in a central um, uh, organization hoster. But now they decided because it is against a data protection law to have such um, a centralized approach that it's only stored on your device. So you have only an exchange between devices where people have to consent um, in the beginning that they, are, um, that they accept the exchange um, with their personal data. And uh, so you don't have a centralized system. Another big problem is also what to do in home offices. It's what you already said, Sony. It's the problem. And now it's a problem whether we are still allowed to use Zoom or Teams or uh, uh, WebEx. So uh, theoretically, under the decision um, from yesterday, it's forbidden to use it anymore. So switch it off, Stefan. Um, but um, you have also other problems in home offices, of course. Uh, it's about security. Because one fundamental principle of the GDPR is also that you have to take adequate technical and organizational measures to secure um, 
proper data protection level. You see, you have also a control of the technique and you have also um, the condition that um, we call it a privacy by design and privacy by default. That means when you um, construct, when you um, write a program for this one app, you already have to obey these two principles, privacy by design, so that it is a minimization uh, that, uh, and uh, by uh, technique, so that the technique uh, enables the highest level of data protection adequate to the specific situation. Um, and so also important uh, in, in our cases is the labor law. I don't know how much it is important for you, Sony, but in labor law, we had a lot of questions, especially in practice, um, how far it is allowed for the employer to inform others that one employee um, has COVID-19. Is he allowed to do so? And what is about uh, when you have a COVID-19 case in your group? Are you allowed to inform the whole group? Are you allowed to inform one department or are you only allowed to inform the supervisor of this person? So you see, um, there's no real decision at the moment, but of course, on the one hand, you have the personal um, rights of the, um, yeah, of the COVID-19 um, infected person. And on the other hand, of course, you have the interest of the people working there, that the, uh, there could be a problem. Um, and we have some cases in Germany where people are working very close together in slaughterhouses, for example, and there you have a lot of cases. Um, for example, there is one um, enterprise in Germany with, let's say, I think they have 2,000 employees and more than 1,000 uh, employees got uh, COVID-19 in this slaughterhouse, you see. Um, this could be difficult in the practice, how to, real, uh, how to realize it, especially in labor law and how, um, um, how far it is um, proper, uh, possible for the employer to deal with this personal data. The basic principles of the German, uh, of, of the general data protection regulation, uh, the basic principles are really uh, very um, similar to the principles you have, Sani, you already told us. The general principle is we have a prohibition with the reservation of permission. The fundamental principle is that it is generally prohibited to process personal data unless there is a justification for it. And that seems to be a, be a little bit odd because whatever you use it, um, everybody is uh, processing your personal data. When you use your mobile phone, when you use an app, when you, when you are uh, opening a website with all the cookies, you have a lot of personal data processed and stored by so many um, instances, but nevertheless, the fundamental principle is prohibition. Um, but you can also have, of course, then justification. We come to it in a minute. Then you have also the, the principle that it must be transparent, the processing of the personal data, and the processing must be limited to the purpose, and you have to define the purpose in the beginning. And um, a difference probably with your system, Asani, is that you have to um, document all of it. You have a documentation obligation. You have to do a lot of documents, a lot of um, files where you describe all your processings. So it means that in... in um, bigger enterprises, you're obliged to have a data protection officer. When you have more than 20 people working with personal data, then you need a data protection officer in your enterprise. And um, he has to document, uh, he has to um, file all the documents that you can prove to the data protection officer, to the data protection authority that they are um, compliant. You see, 
And uh, this could be really problematic in the practice because what entrepreneurs always uh, tell me, of course, they also always tells you, um, they always tell you, we don't earn money with data protection. And so we always have to argue, yes, but you have to spend money in organizing a data protection because it can cost you a lot of money. You don't earn money with it, but when you have to pay, this is um, a problem for you. And it is especially a problem, not only that you have to pay the fines. The fines are normally very moderate. The problem is that the data protection authority can force you to um, reconstruct the whole system, how you store and how you work with personal data, how you process personal data. They can give you um, conditions under which you are um, obliged uh, to organize the technical and organizational measures of your data processing. And this could be even more cost costly than the fines. The fines can be high, of course, but normally they are 5,000 euro or 500 euro or something like that, not so high. But um, to have an order of a data protection authority that you have to reorganize um, the storage of your data and how you process data. And the data protection authority has even the power to stop the data processing. It's, it's, um, it's the final uh, mean, of course, it is ultima ratio, but nevertheless, in cases where they think that there is a high risk for the personal data, the data protection authority can order that you have to stop. And this could be really fundamental for an enterprise. We don't have it yet because um, now the law is only for two years, but nevertheless, this could be a problem in the future. And then, of course, it will cost you more than the 5,000 or um, 10,000 euro. Then you have also um, the principle of data minimization and storage limitation, of course. And, but most important, it is the technical and organizational measures. And you have to document it. You have to... Um, file some documents where you describe how you process the data. And uh, this is the kind of, as I wrote in the end, it is accountability. You have to demonstrate your compliance with these principles. And the authority can ask you to prove it. And um, it is also a good argument at the moment in labor law cases that uh, an employee that he said in a labor law case, um, I want my employer or my ex-employer mostly, I want him to justify why he is allowed to process my personal data. And so you can come to a higher uh, compensation in the end because um, of course, many, many enterprises or nearly most of them are not data protection compliant at the moment. Of course, because it costs money in the beginning. Now we come to the definition of personal data and it is very similar to the definition you already gave us, Sonny. It is that um, any information relating to an identified or identifiable nature person is a personal information. And personal data, personal data uh, open the way to um, to um, use the data protection or the GDPR, open the uh, GDPR. And most important is the identifiable nature of person, as you already said. So it is not only name, address, or all uh, other data, very obvious that they are personal data, but also, for example, the European court decided that uh, uh, an IP address, uh, IP address is a personal data or uh, the information of your mobile phone, the email number, for example. It's also a personal data. And um, you see also GPS data are personal data. And this is also very important for the, for the pandemic um, fight, of course, for COVID-19 that you use, for example, GPS data 
or that you have motion profiles. And um, so we can say in the end, most information are personal um, unless um, any connection to a person can be excluded. So um, in the end, um, we don't have real borders at the moment. What is only an information? Because also information of a machine can be personal because there is also always a person using a machine. So when you have a kind of personal data and somebody can identify this person with an additional information, then it is a personal inform is it's a personal data. And I don't see that there's a limit at the moment. We need a decision um, from the European Court of Justice when something is not a personal information. Because we have a really broad definition of it. And in the in, in, in practice, you always tell the enterprises, please um, take all information as personal data unless they are totally anonymized. Of course, when you have only numbers and it's totally impossible to come um, to a person, to a natural person, uh, then it's okay, it's not a personal data, but normally all information with any link to a person are uh, a personal data and opens um, the GDPR, the, the use of it. So the next step is, and this is very similar to uh, the way you do it in Malaysia and in many other countries is that you need a justification for the processing and there we have different possibilities <laughs> and uh, on the one hand we have the consent of the data subject that what you already says Sony and the consent is for example necessary for the warning app um, the government can't um, put the, the obligation on people that they have to um, install a COVID-19 app. It's only working with the consent. Then you can also um, base your data processing on um, the fulfillment of a contract or the compliance with the legal obligation. Of course, the compliance with the legal obligation is also a justification. And this could be, of course, uh, this could be a regulation from the pandemic legislation, from the infection law. As you already told us, Sony, we have very similar uh, legislation on it. Nevertheless, there's also always a limitation of it. Um, for example, when you're processing special categories of personal data, sensitive data, especially health data, the law always says in the GDPR, you must provide law which provides for suitable and specific measures to safeguard the rights and freedoms of the data subject. Even then, you have to um, find a balance between the different um, interests. So um, you have also the justification when you have to protect vital interest. And um, when the task ca is carried out in the public interest or when it is necessary to process the personal data due to a weighing of interest. There you can strike a balance between interest and when there is not an overwhelming interest of the person, then you are also allowed to um, process personal data when it is necessary. And this is Article 6, Section 1. Um, lit um, F, this necessity, and this is mostly the justification for employers to say, okay, that is a justification why we are allowed um, to inform other um, employees that a specific person is uh, COVID-19 infected. But in this case, you have still strike a balance with the interest of this person. And this is not clear at the moment how you can do it, what is overweighing um, another uh, legal position. So we are just in the discussion how far it is um, allowed. Michael, around 10 minutes more, yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. When you have a consent, 
that's always a problem, you know, um, that this must be voluntary. That is difficult uh, in the field of employment law, of course, because when your employer uh, tells you, you are, um, do you give me your consent? Otherwise, I will fire you. So it's not really very much voluntarily. And it must be um, given on information. You must be well informed that you know what they do with your data. And this is also a problem with the COVID app, for example, or with other measures in the field of um, pandemic um, fight, because sometimes it's difficult for the people to understand what do they do with my data. So, uh, and another problem with the consent is the revocability. You are able to revoke your consent. And what are you doing then? You have the consent, it's revoking, and then uh, the processing is forbidden. So, and all, uh, especially the voluntariness, is really um, difficult to um, justify. So, most of cases in this area, we came to the data processing um, where you have to strike a balance with a legitimate interest. And of course, the fight against COVID-19 is a legitimate interest. But as I already said, you must weight it with other interests. It could be immaterial interest and also commercial interest, but you have to protect at least the personal rights and um, you are not allowed to do everything because you say it is the fight against COVID-19. That's what you already said, Sony. It's not the justification for everything. You are absolutely true. One problem, and that's um, a discussion at the moment, how you can implement it, that you have the rights of the person concerned. You have two paragraphs, 13 and 14, and they contain a very different, uh, differentiated system how you have to inform um, the persons the persons um, about their rights under the uh, GDPR. And um, this can be also, when you give wrong uh, information or um, incomplete information to the data subject, this is also possible that you are fined for it. And we have cases where they fine enterprises with, let's say, half a million euro because they said your privacy notes are wrong or they are uh, incomplete. So um, you have to give all information, but you have to give them, uh, you have to give uh, the information in a way understandable for the people. And that's difficult, you know, how could you uh, explain in your privacy notes how the um, COVID app is working? Or take a, take a um, cookie, uh, on your on your website it's so difficult to explain so it's really it's really um yes difficult how to fulfill this information obligations you have and then you have another uh, right to deletion and to limitation of the processing the same as you already to uh, told us uh, sony it's always um, really um very similar but the most difficult right is at the moment the information right, that you have the right to be informed, that you can go to um, a data processing institution, entity, an um, enterprise, and that you can ask them to inform you what data uh, do you store about me. And that leads to the conclusion, and that's interesting in our univers in university area, a court decided last month that students have the right to get a free copy of all their examinations with the with the notes with the notes of the teacher and that leads to the conclusion that a law student um, got the right from this court decision that he uh, gets a copy of three hundred 78 pages with the personal notes um, of the professor for free. Because in the GDPR, 
it's written you have to get it free. And when you ask, for example, um, eBay, uh, um, Amazon to give you all the information uh, they, they uh, store about you, you get normally two CD-ROM from them. So this information, right, it is, it is perfect. But on the other hand, it could be also a weapon. It can be also a weapon uh, in the hand of um, people who... Um, wants to uh, who wants to um, bring some some trouble into uh, enterprises or it's it's a good weapon for employees for example in the end of their employment they ask their employer to give all information please tell me all information you thought about so we already talked about the fines that's really one of the biggest differences between malaysia and europe as i see at the moment and that they really can um, um, enforce them. It's not only a theoretical number, that was it in the past. Now it is a real number and they can enforce it because they are independent and they do it and there will be high fines in the future. So um, you see the general problems we have uh, in data protection law is now um, focused in this crisis and um, yeah, it's still interesting how to deal with it in practice. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for the presentation. And uh, because we don't have that much time anymore, I would not uh, uh, make a long speech now. So I will go give over to the questioning and answering session. So we will have around uh, 40 to 45 minutes for questioning and answering. Uh, you can uh, raise your virtual hand in the in this uh, in the Zoom, and also better you you do it like this and not speak free. Uh, we can try. Maybe maybe it works. Uh, just you just switch on your micro, and you can also use the chat. I will try to control the chat also. I see we have already question in the chat. Uh, from a colleague who had to leave, um, from Mr. Nasaruddin Abdul Rahman. So maybe we should we start maybe with uh, his question. Yeah, yeah, we can, uh, Prof. Okay, his question is uh, whether competition law can be applied to the area of data privacy protection, like in the case of Facebook. And also, uh, in my opinion, combined to that, how private data protection uh, address consumer rationality. This is uh, really That's interesting. your question. <laughs> <laughs> Just because this is, this is a project uh, we applied for, uh, for a financing uh, by independent uh, institution because we, we do research now on, uh, on the combination between uh, some psychological aspects of the data of the uh, customer rationality uh, and 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 how we make uh, information transparent and I say it's combined to the competition law because uh, we have the same problem in the con consumer protection in the competition law uh, how we inform the consumer and uh, I think the background of this question of Mr. Nazaruddin Abdul Rahman is that uh, the more information, especially technical information, the consumer gets, the, the less he understands maybe. So the paradox is that if we make it very open uh, and give all the information why we collect your data, for what we use it, how we process it, for example, in, uh, in, by the use of, I, the, of uh, artificial intelligence and all these things, these technical aspects, the more we open it, the less the consumer may be informed. This is one point, so the, the, the information overflow. And the second point is uh, the consumer is not rational. There is this uh, privacy paradox on, uh, which says that the consumer, even if he knows there is collecting of his data and it is in his interest to control it, he is um, lazy and uh, he gives even more data. So uh, uh, even if he knows that is dangerous for him. Uh, and we all know that if we have uh, cookies, and we have, the, we have to agree uh, to switch on the cookie or switch off the cookie. I want to have an information and I'm already know, and Michael also already know about that. 
but we always I ask, agree agree I want to read it yeah so uh, Michael we also we, we talk about that what do you think about that absolutely absolutely this is the paradox as you already said it is what I um, mentioned when I said it is about uh, the information you have to give and there can be an information overflow you should you, it's the same when you take a credit from your bank you get so many so much information because they are obliged to inform you as much as they can mm. but they should also do it in an understandable way it's written in the law it's the same in data protection law but it's a contradiction because now you have data protection um, privacy notes really many pages because the enterprise of course want to secure that they are safe on the other hand who is reading 20 pages where nobody. every cookie is explained <laughs> nobody so my plea was always to have a simple law where you have some fundamental rights where you have some fundamental information but to have this um, approach to inform um, the consumer about everything. And in the end, it's not that he is informed. In the end, it's only about that a, that a judge can decide whether this information was enough or not. It is not real information. It is more um, whether it could be justified in front of a court. Um, the other point mentioned with the competition law is really interesting because we have a case at the moment in Germany whether Facebook also... Um, is in breach of um, antitrust law and of uh, competition law with their data protection policy. So um, there isn't a final decision at the moment, but there is, a, there is a court decision that this could be possible and now a court will decide about it. So you have it and you have it also in unfair competition law. We have cases in Germany where one enterprise sues another enterprise because they say your privacy notes, your um, data protection information um, are not enough. They don't comply with, with the GDPR. So you infringe the market because you have an advantage um, from your from your wrong or incomplete uh, privacy notes. And that's why we sue you. And you have some courts in Germany. Um, some courts decide, yes, it's a breach of unfair competition law. And you have also other um, courts uh, deciding in the other way. And now we are waiting for a decision from the federal court. Because imagine when you come to a decision from the federal court, which, uh, which says, Yes, it is a breach of unfair competition law. When your competitor, when your competitor has incomplete information on data protection, then it is a perfect field for uh, lawyers to earn money, of course. Um, that's good on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's really another weapon to discriminate your competitors. And especially when you're only a small enterprise in the internet, for example, it's not always Facebook. Facebook gives a shit when they have to pay 20 million euro, they pay 20 million euro. It's more a problem for the small enterprises. And that's also connected with COVID. You have a lot of small enterprises trying to establish new services in the internet. Startups you have also in Malaysia. But now when you have competitors, and they can sue you because they say your privacy notes are wrong. This is a problem. This is a problem so you can destroy really um, a new market. So we are really um, waiting for this decision uh, because we have um, yeah, different opinions on it from different uh, courts. I mean, the I problem in the a... breach of law uh, article in the act, maybe I can add that short, the problem in this uh, breach of law, this, act, this, this article is very difficult to apply because it says it must be a rule which also uh, is intended to regulate market conduct in the interest of market participants and the breach of law is felt to appreciably be harming the interest of consumers, other market participants and competitors. And the problem is that it must be combined 
with the interest of uh, with, with with market conduct. So uh, the, the data protection is maybe not focusing directly on the market uh, uh, conduct. This is the this is the the dispute about it. How far we can say that data protection law is also aimed to the conduct in the market for the in the interest of the competition. Yeah. And uh, that will be that will be the the, the, the main point on on, on this uh, uh, from the methodic. Okay, Definitely, sorry. and then you come to a decision in court where you have to discuss every rule of your privacy notes, where you have to discuss. Uh, you can take a look into Article um, 12, 13, and 14 after, um, um, which information you have to give to the uh, to the data subject. There is a really differentiated system, a lot of information you have to give. And so you come to argumentation in court whether you fulfilled um, Article 13, um, yes. subsection the court, 2. The courts always said they don't want to, uh, to use this Article 3a about the market conduct and the breach of law. Um, uh, in order to use the, the, the act on unfair competition to uh, avoid every behavior uh, without the competition law. You can theoretically use every, every rule in the, in the law, in the law system, which is a breach, which is theoretically, of course, giving an advantage who is uh, not compliant to the law is always having a certain advantage, right? And that is what the courts not want. So this is why it is very restrictive. There is a long tradition of, of uh, uh, judicative on that. Although some high courts decided this way, for example, the High Court of uh, Hamburg and so on, yeah, you have yeah. some high courts decisions. And about this uh, this uh, transparency, there are ideas about uh, red light systems, yeah, red, yellow, green, uh, for example, to simplify the information for the for the consumer. But this is uh, uh, not yet. This is in the moment very much in the discussion. So maybe the next question, Mr. Mr. Zoni had a question or you raised the, the hand. Oh, you must switch on the micro. Sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry, yeah. I just want to know if uh, the GDPR as it is now today would have some uh, compelling uh, rule that this data policy or privacy policy should be made in such a simple way should not be uh, that uh, troublesome for reader. Is there any part in the GDPR to impose on that? Um, well, because it is said that you, um, when you give consent, uh, then you must be an informed person. It means that you have to give the information in the way um, understandable for, for the specific person. You have to do it in an understandable way. And that means, for example, in the uh, in the labor context, in the, in the um, working surrounding, that you must theoretically inform the different employees in a different way. You see, connected uh, with the level of their work. When you have a, mm -hmm. a person working on a computer all the day and uh, used to work with text, then you can have a higher level of explanation. And uh, when you have somebody working on a machine, you need a... a more simple explanation of it but of yeah. course in practice it's difficult to fulfill and we had the problem sony when we had um, a lot of refugees two years ago you remember so uh, we had a million refugees in germany and all of them of course have to uh, go to some medical care they um, have to uh, get some treatment so on and of course they have to give their consent uh, yeah. to it yeah, of course, that's okay. But the question was, in how many languages uh, do you have to give the information? And you know, it's not only English and uh, um, Arabic and, and German or what, whatever, or Italian. You have also a lot of uh, dialects in the Arabic world. So yes. the question was, uh, yeah, but how can you do it? You have people from 20 nations or 13, even more. And you should uh, give every person adequate information. I mean, I think in Malaysia, you have also a lot of dialects. So Language. how can you inform them? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, Mrs. Dean. Hello again. <laughs> Hello. 
Yeah, Prof Ida wanted Pre to first yeah. question. Yeah. Prof Ida. Hi, Prof Ku. So nice to meet Hello. you again. Hi. Nice to meet you again. You're quite um, bright, even though it's uh, night time there. <laughs> as yeah, in, as in, you, you were sleep deprived. <laughs> a lot of coffee. <laughs> Tons of coffee. Now, you didn't sleep, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to thank the two speakers. It has been a beautiful presentation. But I would like to be the devil advocate. Now, you know that pen, uh, COVID-19, the pandemic COVID-19 is not a normal period. It's an emergency period. We are fighting COVID-19. We are in a war. And if you remember the phrase, all is fair in love and war. I wish I'm in love, but we are in a war. <laughs> and I know there are a lot of measures that the Malaysian government, uh, that what the Malaysian government has done was a bit, drastic, a bit stringent. But at the end, we Malaysians enjoy it. Now we are able to go out, to move out, you know, unlike those in Europe and those in um, US or in Australia where they have a second lockdown, you know. So we really appreciate what the government has done. They were very, very stringent. It was the first time that we had to be confined to our house for three months and stay with our family. And a lot of their measures with regard to contact tracing were we find justifiable and reasonable because it was during war. Now I know security is never is not mentioned in the legislation as one of the exceptions for um, you know minim, um, I wouldn't say trampling with uh, personal data right, but actually minimizing uh, or balancing uh, the personal uh, data protection right in favor of the security of the nation, right? Because COVID-19 is such that it is very infectious and if one person gets it and the whole community gets it. So I find that sometimes we have to look at all these measures in a different light and we also have to look at the personal data protection law in a different light because we are not in a normal situation here. Um, Take for example, if you look at the apps that were developed by the Malaysian government, one of the apps were actually developed by our university. Um, it's our scientists, our researchers who develop it, MyTrace, uh, together with the Ministry of Science. The MyTrace, actually, the uh, information that were located were not the geolocation geo data, but actually it's to, using Bluetooth, it's to determine um, who are in direct contact with that person. And that is very much um, in, um, useful for contact tracing. Whether you like it or not, contract tracing will trample with personal privacy. And it is very much needed because of the nature of COVID-19 itself. It's very infectious. So you need to know who are in close contact with that person. However you do it, however you do it, you have to you have to you know, step on other people's toes. So it's very much needed. So when we talk about um, privacy and privacy by design, the way to do it is to develop a technology which is least intrusive in a, you know, in a manner, right? Least intrusive. And I would have thought that my trace where you do not disclose the geographical location, but instead tra track whoever is in the surrounding will be, you know, is, is a good technology. It's the least intrusive manner. And whether you like it or not, in our university, since we open up to uh, students for face-to-face -face, um, uh, lessons, we've already made it compulsory for the students to download my suggestor and my, my trace because when, when you are in charge of security of an organization or a, or a university or even so in a country, you have to take all these measures to protect your public interest. And I, there's, another, there's another thing which I wanted to respond. Well, one thing you mentioned that, you know, perhaps we should respect the person's privacy by not revealing whether that person is infected or not. But actually, the demand is the other way around. People want to know because they want to protect themselves. You know, people are so distrust of the others. So these are the steps that you have to take to ensure that, you know, you are in a good environment, you are safe, you know, you want to go out and about, 
carrying on with ordinary duties. And the only way you can do it is that you have this certainty that when you step out of the house that people around you also take the same measures and they are as healthy as you so this is also a question of balance and thirdly with regard to the point which uh, sony mentioned about the data taken um, from uh, visitors uh, like i mentioned uh, the ic number um, this is something very um, openly done in Malaysia, even if you, before COVID-19 as well, if you step into a government office or a company, they take your IC number, you know, because of the security of the building. So for me, um, you know, there's nothing new about it, all right? There's nothing new about it. And perhaps in COVID-19, we have to step on, on it. And Alhamdulillah, with the stringent measures that the government has done now, Malaysians, now we are able to go out and about and enjoy ourselves in restaurants while there are many other parts of the world which are still under strict lockdown. Thank you very much. Now, one question to um, Prof. Boni. You mentioned about um, data minimization and storage limitation. How is that possible in COVID-19? Because we were told that this COVID-19 is going to last for another two years, right? And patients who have um, cured can even recur with COVID-19. So how long do you think uh, the storage limitation should be in, in a pandemic like COVID-19? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And um, yeah, you, you make some very good points, of course. Um, on the other hand, um, it is always difficult when you um, don't uh, obey your principles uh, in crisis, whether you can come back uh, to a more um, strict um, legal um, obeying of personal rights. And when you see in Europe, for example, or the, in, in, the, uh, the, in, in contrast in the US where you don't have very strict data protection legislation, and on the other hand in Europe and especially in Germany where, where they're really strict, in this terms, and of course, sometimes they, they, uh, it's overdone, of course. Uh, we talked about the business card and there are some other craziness. So <laughs> you are absolutely right. But on the other hand, it, um, it looks like that the data protection level and um, yes, for example, the number of debt doesn't correspond. You see, because in Germany, we have um, in comparison a lower um, um, mortality rate than in the US where they have a lower um, level of data protection and that's um, connected with the health system. You know, in Germany you have a good working health system where people can go freely to the doctor, to their uh, um, general practitioner, to the, to the hospital where everybody is insured in, in um, with health with healthcare insurance in the us you don't have such a public system you are not insured automatically so people were waiting a lot of time until they go to a de to a general practitioner and um, when they have covid 19 they are not allowed to work so they are not uh, not not earning money in germany you have legislation that you uh, get paid even when you are uh, ill for for six weeks or something like that you see it's not always connected only with data protection it is more um in the complete system you see of of health um service for example when you look in great britain they have really a poor a national health system um, i think sony when you um, were in, in in britain you have realized that they have really a poor system with a lot of um debt I mean, they have uh, five times than we have in Germany and we are bigger than Great Britain. So it's not always connected with um, data protection law. And uh, on the other hand, you are, of course, you are right. You must see how can we find um, a way to deal with our fundamental principles so that uh, we um, really apply the rules we have now and on the other hand, to um, yes, to fight against COVID, because you see the argument that we are in a war was so often an argument to implement stricter regulations and to limit personal rights. So of course it is a war in a sense, 
uh, in a way, but nevertheless, um, sometimes ho hopefully we come back to peace and then we want to have also a working uh, legal system. And then I'm not so sure that it is so easy to go back, you see. And um, you come to the um, limitation um, of, of uh, how long you are allowed to store data. There isn't any clear definition, you know. Um, when you say, okay, it will last for two years, then you can see, okay, we can store it for three years. But you have to define it. You have to define it. I told you uh, that you need a documentation of every data you store. And there you have also to define how long the data uh, should be stored. That's really easy when it is about phone numbers. How long are you allowed to give somebody a marketing call? There you can say, okay, two years. No, that's, that's easy. In, in the case of, of, of a pandemic um, uh, of, um, of a COVID-19 virus, that's difficult to define. There's maybe one aspect uh, additionally because of uh, what, what Michael said and what also combined to what you said, how long should we store about the Corona app in Germany. Uh, and it's also combined to the trust you mentioned. I mean, we need the solidarity in the society and the society should learn to trust to each other, also to the authorities, because our Corona app has no uh, possibility to, uh, to, to, to switch if you are already healed, if you don't have the virus anymore. So once you, once you announce in the app, you have the virus. You are, mm -hmm. uh, you, you have, a, you have the uh, the test that you are positive, uh, and then after three, four weeks, you are not positive anymore. You cannot put it into the app. So the people think, well, what happens if I announce that I'm positive? If that app is uh, uh, having that information now forever, and then maybe in two months I want to fly somewhere, and then they find, oh, this is, this is, this is he was positive tested, but the app does not say you are not positive anymore. So uh, this is this is of course a problem, yeah. So because this this is a um, how can I say this is a stigma, right, for the people. At least people uh, feel there is a stigma. Maybe it's not they may, because our app is not giving much information. There is only a, a real time Bluetooth contact, yeah. And actually, this app is not used for giving the authorities information who was positive or not. If you want to enter uh, authority buildings or you want to enter a plane. But the people, for the people, it is strange that they cannot announce they are now not positive anymore. So we have still 15 minutes. I think we have time for one or two more short questions, right? Uh, let me read one from the chat also. Mm -hmm. Actually, yeah. it was sent privately to me, maybe by mistake. Oh, okay. Oh, this is a kind of a, a suggestion. Uh, can we make a data protection policy for the apps in a way that the permission should be limited in terms of time and also the app must prompt every time they use and use only when they want to use storage to save pictures, etc. And also the space, uh, meaning they should prompt every time, so they should mention when they use uh, only when uh, when they use the limited space and so on so it must also be in the layman term and simple this is like an opinion which i i obviously agree with this but uh, obviously uh, we need uh, we need uh, system developers uh, to help us <laughs> that's why in this situation i think uh, both uh, lawyers and system developers must talk and communicate how to make the best uh, uh, terms uh, for the apps. Uh, otherwise, as what has been described by uh, Michael, that uh, things can burden consumers. Or any uh, other opinions from speakers or moderator? Michael? Oh, you're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, obviously. And uh, maybe I want to comment a little bit, Prof Ida. Thank you for the uh, comment. <laughs> I agree that uh, all these practices of people collecting uh, IC and so on, which are not supposedly, uh, not necessarily correct, has been there for some time. But uh, the way we see it now, of course, it gets intensified due to the COVID things. Uh, and I would rather say that this is ideally uh, not correct. I mean, this has to change somewhere 
in the future that it should not be made so easy that people collect our uh, IC uh, data and so on. Yeah, I think we are still learning and we are still catching up uh, for this uh, particular practice. Maybe it takes some time to really comply. I think we have another question to you, uh, Parsoni, from Mr. Yeah. Nazaruddin Abdul Rahman, which is also interesting me and Michael uh, also, I'm sure. Uh, how yeah. far the P, uh, PDPA is enforced effectively in Malaysia? Uh, well, uh, because well, he's well, stating well. that uh, after, uh, after the uh, <coughs> intro of the PDPA, uh, there was, uh, in his uh, feeling, even more breach of the law, uh, infringement of the law than before. <laughs> so this is interesting. How, how, what is your opinion on that? No, I must say uh, things uh, actually grow naturally. You know what? Now people will, uh, are more aware of their rights. So they are more demanding of, uh, their, of the protection of their data. But at the same time, the technology has uh, developed so much that it is made so easy. It's made easier to to abuse uh, personal data. So it is not that the law is adamant. No, the law I think is working, and the authority is working. Though it, the, it they are working in a very slow uh, pace, as opposed to the growth of the technology and the issues that we currently have. But I can say that uh, the enforcement actually is moving because I know how it was before and now actually we see more cases uh, brought to the courts and we see more uh, f uh, compounds uh, imposed and some uh, prosecutions are successful even though it is not very satisfactory that the courts only give very nominal uh, minimum uh, amount of uh, damages of uh, what, go ahead, fines yeah so, but, but I can say it is moving, but uh, yeah, quite slowly. Is there another short question of a participant? If I can ask a last question. Of course. To the two speakers. Right. I think one area which is largely ignored is with regards to um, the sharing of data of patients suffering from COVID-19 for the purpose of development of vaccines and drugs, you know, for COVID-19. Um, you know that there are many variants to this COVID-19. Uh, in Malaysia itself, I, I heard from the scientists themselves, the ones who have done the sequencing, they have identified a number of variants. So there is actually a, a global move or global effort to um, have clinical data um, or patients you know, uh, participating in trials, in human trials, looking at, uh, not only in terms of sequencing, but trying to identify what will be a suitable vaccine because there will not be a single suitable vaccine because, because of the many variants. So the way I see it, you, the, um, we also have to look at how we strengthen cooperation in terms of data sharing, data sharing in, in the wake of coming out with this vaccine and, and necessary drugs, you know, for COVID-19. We were told that, you know, the vaccine will be coming end of this year, but it may not be so. We are we also told that there are a number of companies that are working on it, on using different technologies. So there is also a need to talk about the, the sharing of data there, you know, the sharing of data of, of patients suffering from COVID-19 for the purpose of development of drugs. And, and vaccines, especially um, Indonesia has also, I think, participated in the human trials. Malaysia, not so much because we don't have that many patients in comparison to Indonesia. They have a larger amount or a larger number of patients um, suffering from uh, COVID-19. Uh, how do you think we should uh, we, we address this situation, especially in response to trying to balance privacy rights? and you know, coming, developing uh, drugs and vaccine. Okay. Uh, let me try first, then Prof. Bonnie okay. can... Uh, uh, <clears throat> this is uh, one of the, those use of data which is, I, I, I uh, agree to be very justifiable. It is a very justifiable situation mm -hmm. that we use personal information for the purpose of either knowledge or research, uh, which ultimately will serve uh, humanity 
uh, public order, you know, public health and so on. And in fact, this has been accommodated by the PDPA at uh, uh, 2010. Uh, that this kind of clinical research activities uh, will have the basis uh, to be uh, given, uh, I mean, to be allowed, yeah, I mean, to be given a relaxation from the rules. One of the reasons is that, uh, one of the basis is that if the, if this uh, clinical research and as well as the use of the personal data for this uh, clinical research uh, is, uh, conducted and processed by the government, we know that there is a blanket exemption for it, number one. Number two, if it is done by private sectors and private hospitals, they actually there is this uh, provision which allows that uh, the processing of medical research, uh, medical, uh, uh, sorry, processing of personal data for medical purpose uh, will be uh, given some relaxation. And this actually is the way that we allow uh, for this uh, particular uh, purpose that Prof. Ida was mentioning. Uh, other than that, but, when it comes sorry, to... Sorry, I think we should, we should think beyond that. We should think of cross-border data exchange. Right. So I agree. Yes. I agree. Let me uh, do the PDPA first. So, <laughs> so there is this area of research that allows uh, such research to be allowed, to be used, uh, to be uh, done, uh, processing personal data as long as the uh, result is made uh, anonymous. Then I, I agree, just uh, rightly pointed out by uh, Prof. Ida, because this is not only Malaysian issue, this is regional, this is uh, global, that we must look into uh, basically global uh, agreement, a global uh, uh, commitment, uh, more specifically uh, to, to, be, uh, to allow us uh, processing data in such a, a way. And uh, this is a truly international agenda and uh, Malaysia should, uh, I think, uh, lead also, given the fact that in this region, Malaysia is the first country who has the personal data protection law. And uh, it is very uh, natural that Malaysia takes this issue uh, uh, and leading this issue in this region and try to come up with global, uh, regional and global commitment together. But. Uh, as long as this is done and properly done, uh, then uh, we, we can uh, talk about the technicalities. Uh, and, and protecting privacy for everyone's uh, knowledge, of course, it is not only about whether you can collect the data or not. Sometimes collecting data is okay or is given some uh, relaxation, but uh, there, there, there is more to privacy than collecting the data, isn't it? We are also talking about uh, uh, processing, about uh, exploiting the data, about disclosing the data, sharing it to others. So uh, it has to be done rather comprehensively. And uh, also the people who are manning the data, I mean, this all is not a very small uh, scope of work. It is a big work. Uh, so basically that's my, my comment. Yeah. Prof. Wone, maybe? Okay, we have one more question of Mr. Zodik Omola from Nigeria. Uh, what is the scope for internal grievance mechanism for data privacy rules under the EU General Data Protection Regulation? Maybe uh, this question go to uh, Professor Bone. Yeah, thank you. Very good question and you can't answer it in a few sentences. So um, it is important, I think uh, you uh, speak about e-search and such a subject, whistleblower hotlines uh, and whistleblowing. Um, this is really a problem. Nevertheless, um, we will get a new legislation, especially on whistleblowing in the EU, how to protect whistleblowers, but on the other hand, of course, uh, also to protect uh, persons uh, that nothing is um, told about them, uh, which is wrong. Uh, so you have the possibility to have some uh, such uh, internal search, um, especially in um, companies, of course, uh, but, uh, of course, at the moment, it's a little bit difficult. That's why now they are drafting um, a legis legislation, especially on whistleblowing. Because we have okay. realized in the Volkswagen case, you know, the scandal, um, a Volkswagen with the, with the um, machines, um, that there is importance for, for strong whistleblower rights. Okay. Of course, there is a contradiction to uh, data protection, definitely. Thank you, Michael. 
Uh, I have to correct myself. Uh, Mr. S Dr. Sodik Omola is uh, originally from Nigeria, as I remember, but now, of course, lecturer at uh, International uh, Islamic University of Kuala Lumpur, of Malaysia, uh, and of ICOL. I think we are, our time runs out, unfortunately, for this topic, but we will have a, a next season in next, a next session in next week. And I hope we will have a similar vivid discussion and uh, participants, many participants like today. Uh, I like this uh, session very much. I hope uh, you took uh, a lot of profit from our uh, session this morning. And uh, so I will want to thank you, thank all the participants and all uh, uh, the people behind, all the questioning people, and also especially to uh, Pasoni and uh, 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 our uh, moderator, uh, not moderator. Yes, our, also our host, to the moderator. <laughs> our host today, uh, um, uh, for uh, <laughs> Mr. Saidul. Uh, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's Saidul. Yes, uh, and yeah. So I, I close the session for today. Uh, can I, I just uh, remind? Week. May I remind Prof. Stefan? Uh, for those who are here, we we uh, invite you to fill up the oh yeah the form for the purpose of the e certificate. So it is uh, if you need it, if you want it. So go to this uh, uh, link that we provide in the chat box. I am helped by Dr. Aznan from ICT faculty uh, in preparing this uh, uh, Google form. You see how mm -hmm. vulnerable law professor can be. Yeah, we don't know how to create the Google form. <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Aznan from the ICT faculty for helping me on this. And from myself, my part, thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Michael, for being with thank us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Ida, and Dr. Zaidul, Dr. Sodik, my colleagues. Dr. Juria, okay, uh, Prof. Juria, and then uh, Dr. Nasa, and of course, uh, all my beloved students. I can see many students around. My PhD students, <laughs> master students. Dr. Nazri also from UNISA, he is there. Thank you. Dr. Aznan, yeah. Thank okay, you very I'm much. Done. I'm done, uh, thank yeah. you so much. Have thank a nice you. day. See thank you next you week. Much. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you, students. Thank you. Ada Pak Girang from Pak Girang, yes. Nama dari UPSI. Yeah. Thank you for being with us. Dr. Saidul, can you give me the hostage back? <laughs> and what about that recording? You may want to stop the recording. And oh, yeah, stop the recording, yeah. Uh -huh. I will stop it. Uh, I will stop it. Yeah. Yes. You, you please stop the recording and then you uh, change the host back to Prof. Stephen. Shakil, are you okay, Shakil? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Yeah, everyone. thank you, Stephen and Michael. Thank you. Bye. We'll, we shall be in touch.